Judge Catrice Tilwane. Good afternoon, Chief Justice. Are you well? Yes, very well, thank you. Well, based on what has been happening with those who came before you, I think we'll start it easy first before okay. we get into, uh, into uh, 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 questions that are a bit challenging. Very well, thank you. Um, how long after completing your LLB did you uh, become a law clerk for Justice Mokoro? Oh, it was about, uh, I'm trying to think, I finished my LLB a uh, few years, because I went, I finished my LLB, I worked at the Legal Resources Center on their fellowship program for a year and a half. During that time, I won a Fulbright scholarship and went across to uh, the US, to Washington DC to study a master's in law. Yes. Um, I came back to South Africa and in 1994, I then, I came back because it was the election year and I wanted to be back in South Africa, I couldn't be away. Yes. from South Africa at that time, it was too important. Uh, in 1994, I worked for the IEC during the election period, and thereafter at the University of Western Cape. And then Judge Albie Sachs then basically alerted me to the fact that the, con the Constitutional Court judges were looking for clerks. And I then applied, and uh, Justice Mokoro um, was the first judge to basically contact me. And I then flew to Johannesburg to be interviewed by her, and she then appointed me on the spot. Yes. What was your master's program about? Uh, it was a broad master's program. It was a course of master's program. I did, course, I did constitutional law, uh, gender and the law, um, sexual orientation and on the, on, on the law, homelessness, homelessness law, uh, employment law, Title VII employment law. Um, yeah, I think there were about seven or eight subjects, I can't remember. It was a, it was a, a coursework master's. Yes. Fulbright scholarship, is that the scholarship started by Senator Fulbright of the U.S. some many years ago? Yes, Chief Justice. Yes. yes. And a lot of yes. South African students have gone through that program. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. Do you, all right, okay. Um, what was his philosophy? What did he believe in? What was his uh, approach to life issues? Well, I think a kind of... I, I did a bit of reading. I just wanted yeah. to find out from you how well, I mean, I fairly think, well you know him. Yeah, I mean, I don't know him too well. <laughs> yes. And I think it wasn't it's something dear to me at the time. We just kind of saw... Full, uh, you just saw an thing. opportunity yes. and grabbed it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And how was your experience as a law clerk? I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, Chief Justice. It was such an important year for us. Uh, we were treated so well that year. It was so amazing to be at the Constitutional Court on the very day that it was opened by President Mandela at the time. Yes. It was, it was an experience that I just can't describe. Well. Uh, it was just a beautiful time and to be there for the first cases, uh, to be part of that very historic year of the court was so important to my development as a lawyer going forward. Yes. yes. From what I hear, there are a lot of egos that fly around and some clerks even say, uh, with reference to uh, the, the judgments of their judges, I wrote this judgment. Uh, did you have that uh, kind of I've, I've, egotistical I've, approach to issues even back then? Yes, 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 there was that, and we heard that. We heard rumors of that. But I can, I can, I can assure you that none of us wrote any of those judgments. But there were claims. Yeah, there were claims. There were, <laughs> there were a few of us who basically a judge would ask you to do research on a particular issue, Yes. And we produced the research on a particular issue, and we produced the memorandum yes. of research. And that's how it has been with all law, uh, law researchers. Yes. You know, nobody writes the judgments of the judges. And I think that's very unfair of, of clerks to, to, to state that they've been writing judgments of judges. Maybe it's human weakness. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Probably. And um, what did you do after, after, your, 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 the, after the end of your term? as law clerk? I then, I was planning to go and work at the, go back to the University of Western Cape. The University of Western Cape actually seconded me to the court. So I was planning to go back to the University of Western Cape. And I then just watching, watching the council in court every day applying their trade. I decided I would like to go to the bar. And, um, but it was difficult because I didn't know how I was going to afford to go to the bar. Because I didn't, you know, it meant finding a scholarship I hadn't applied in time, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I then remembered that the LRC was so dear to me, and they used to offer a program to some of its lawyers and, and, and some of their young fellows, where you could actually do your fellowship at the Legal Resources Center, 
but also, uh, not your fellowship, actually you could work as a law, young lawyer at the Legal Resources Center, but also serve pupillage at the same time. Yes. And uh, there are a few of us that have gone through that. I think Judge Justice Nafsa has gone through it. Uh, uh, Advocate Patrick Omsholana has gone through it. And now the LRC has created a formal uh, scholarship program, uh, sorry, a, a, a foundation in terms of which they, they give pu pupils money yes. for the year to basically uh, do pupillage for, for yes. that year. Yes, so, so when did you um, become a, a full-time member of the bar? Uh, well, at, while I was, well, the moment I finished pupillage, and I passed the exam, so I think that was 1990, uh, I can't remember now, 96. Around 96? 96. 96, yes, yes, yes. And um, you, were, you were active in, in Nadal at the time. Yes, I was active. With the fact from 97, wasn't it? Yes, I was, uh, I was active in the politics of the bar. Uh, I was a Nadal member, I think, but not, uh, I, I was active in transformation at the bar from the time yes. I was a baby junior at the bar. Um, so my, my contemporaries then would have been Patrick Mshaulala, Dali, Dali and Popu were still there at the time, but he was far senior to us. So yes. even though I wasn't, I wasn't on the bar structures as such, we basically started to get involved in the bar politics in the, the early years. Is, is that what explains how you ended up being assistant honorary secretary and then honorary secretary of the uh, indeed, general chief. counsel of the bar? Yes, indeed, Chief Justice. <clears throat> What were the major aspects of the politics of the bar at the time? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, I think the old, the age-old problem of briefing patterns. Of? Briefing patterns. Yes. Black lawyers, women, black men were just not getting the commercial work. They were getting work from the state attorney, but they were just not getting the big commercial work. Uh, I think black women uh, and women generally were the most disadvantaged because they basically had to deal, you know, had to make do with practices, um, family law practices. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with having a family law practice, but I think there are women with far more talent uh, who needed to be exposed to broader work. Yes. Uh, commercial yes. work, constitutional work, admin work, you know, So what strategy now um, in your involvement in the politics of the bar together with everybody else did did you develop as a collective to confront this challenge? Yes, I mean, I think, I think one of the, the strategies was basically to uh, the, I think it was the second junior program, um, the second junior program, because if you had, you know, if, if a senior council had a junior, either a, a white woman junior or a white man junior, or even a, a, a black man, then they were obliged to basically bring in a second junior and preferably a, a, a young woman. Black woman from the bar. Beyond that, uh, was, there, was there an avenue created for engagement with those who, who had the power to make work available to practitioners? Yes, I was directly involved in that, where we invited um, practitioners uh, to programs of the bar, um, where we basically, so you'd invite six or seven lawyers from Weber Wenzel or from Worksman's or from Edward Nathan, and then we'd invite a group of young juniors, black women juniors and, 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 and male uh, and, and men juniors to, to these, um, whatever, you'd call it a tea party or an afternoon cocktail in order to, to, for them to be introduced to uh, attorneys from the law firms. That generated some work, but you know what happens, Chief Justice? It's a mindset that needs changing. So in order to... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I've, I've had flu this last yeah, week. Feel free to pour water, no yeah. rush, take yes. your time. I want you to be as comfortable yeah. as you need to be. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Uh, it was, for that moment, it was okay. For that moment, you'd find that an attorney from Weber Wentz will say, yes, 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 I'm completely committed to this transformation program at the bar. I'm happy to brief two or three juniors. And they'll brief the two or three juniors in one or two briefs, and then it's, you know, it's slowly forgotten, or very quickly forgotten, and they go back to their usual briefing patterns and, and brief the same men time and time and time again, you know. And so I, I'm not really certain that those programs worked very well. Uh, we had to change the mindset. We had to change the mindset of the white community at the bar as well, and the male community at the bar. So we started introducing um, uh, gender diversity workshops. Um, there was a a lot of resistance to that in the beginning. Um, but, 
but slowly this advocate started to kind of see the value in it. And I think over time, and after I left, um, the, the VAR's been having more uh, programs around gender diversity. Yes. Um, so it's an ongoing process. Um, you know, the VAR's sort of fragmenting, and there have yes. been these breakouts into different uh, groups. Um, I was thinking more about a comprehensive strategy um, as advocates, as Nadell, mm -hmm. advocates for transformation, that is designed not only to have work released um, to women and uh, black practitioners in a generic sense, but also attorneys, because uh, Verkmans and all the others are, are not easily going to make their competitors who are attorneys have work. I was looking at something more comprehensive, more robust, more national that says, we're going to engage with your MTNs, voter comms, after all, most of their support comes from these people, Tiger Brands, who consumes Iwisa and so on, state-owned enterprises, so that there is a, a deliberate program mm -hmm. to have a significant portion of the, of the litigation work available uh, to them, or that they have, rather, uh, distributed to the previously disadvantaged. Yes, uh, was there a program like that? Because it doesn't look like there is much enthusiasm to confront what matters the most. No, that, you're quite right. There wasn't a program like that. There wasn't a composite program. While I was at the bar, I don't remember Nadell or the, 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 the attorney's profession coming together with the bar to basically try and formulate a policy to, to go forward and try and engage with all of these issues that were affecting the legitimacy of the bar or the attorney's pr profession uh, insofar as it was predominantly white and male. Yes. Uh, and that is something that should have happened uh, much earlier I do know that our, you know, advocates of transformation were not in Johannesburg. Um, it started off in the Cape and in Natal and were very strong there, and it took a little while before um, it took on in Johannesburg. But I think the, uh, the, the strength of the black community at the bar uh, was consolidated once Af Afri advocates for transformation uh, basically um, became part of the bar structure. Yes. And then um, when did the interest in uh, assuming judicial responsibilities develop? Um, I think through the time that I was an advocate, from time to time I got calls from um, uh, the late um, Justice Bam to ask me to come and sit with him at the, at the, at the land claims court. Um, and I said to him, Justice Bam, I'll do it very soon and then you know, I, I could never give him the real commitment because it was always something that came up. Yes. Um, I then left the bar because I really felt like, well, I was, it was an invitation that I got from Worksman's attorneys. What I did was completely unprecedented. I had left the bar and I had joined Worksman's attorneys, but not, not the firm of attorneys, but uh, a PTY limited. So I wouldn't be breaching any of the rules. Um, and I think while I was there, I missed the bar terribly, to be honest. I missed the bar terribly. I got involved in transformation issues at, at, at Worksman's, but I missed the bar because I was a creature of the bar. How did it work? What was the difference between the attorney's, uh, the attorney's firm or company and, and the PTY Limited that you had joined? Well, it was just basically, it was a, it was a you know, I, wouldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't partake in the profits and stuff of the firm. So we basically were paid through the PTY Limited. Uh, we received our income from there. To do what? Uh, well, I mean, I was a, I was a, for all intents and purposes, I was an advocate, you know. Oh, an in-house advocate? Uh, in-house advocate. I did a lot of in-house work. Oh, I didn't know that uh, such a thing existed. Yes, they, uh, some of the firms have taken that on. Wow. And now with the legal practice bill, I think it's, a, it's something that will develop. What I did at the time, as, as I was leaving um, Worksman's, the reason for, well, I suppose, the day I put in my resignation at Worksman's, my DJP in uh, uh, the Joburg High Court happened to hear from somebody that I was leaving uh, Worksman's to go back to the bar. Uh, and he immediately called me up and asked me to come and act. And yes. I then met with him. And so he basically planted the seed. 
And uh, that was the end of my practice because once I started acting at his court, uh, I spent six or nine months there and he said, no, no, you're not going back to the bar. And then uh, you apply. I want you to apply, yes. And you were, you were appointed. I was appointed. I was a bit reluctant at the time because I believed that I needed to go back to the bar in order to get uh, silk, and I thought yes. I need to practice for a few more years to get silk. Yes. And uh, he said to me, it wasn't necessary, but I just felt uncomfortable. I felt I needed, I needed the, you know, I needed my colleagues to basically give me that go ahead. Yes. And uh, the bar council then came back to me and they said that they will nominate me. Yes. Um, and for me, that meant that I had the confidence of my peers, yes. and I was then ready to come to the bench. And That's you right. served in a number of courts. I mean, you served in the Land Claims Court, the Labor Court, the uh, Competition Appeal Court, the Labor Appeal Court. T tell us um, what, uh, what contribution that experience, that diversity of experience, um, um, had to your development as a judge. Yes, I think, I mean, I just think having appellate experience makes you a stronger judge. Uh, you start seeing a case from different angles that you don't ordinary, ordinarily do when you're sitting as a single judge. Um, I didn't sit in the land claims court, uh, Chief Justice. I sat oh, in the I Labor thought Appeal I court. saw something here. I, I would have... Uh, I thought you sat as an acting judge there, pardon no, no. me. And no. when you mentioned the Judge Bam, that even... Uh, oh reinforced my, my, my thinking that I, I saw right. So you never acted no, there? No, I didn't act there. He had approached me to act there at some oh, point. Oh, but you and didn't. I didn't. I couldn't. And then the charge of tunes you never wrote. But I did. Uh, I used to practice. I used to do cases in the land okay, place court. Okay, okay. Yeah. You may okay. have seen that. But no. I, I, after the high court, the first appellate um, acting experience I had was the Supreme Court of Appeal. Yes. How uh, was your experience there? It was very, I mean, I, it was a very interesting time. Uh, it, was a, there was a, it was a steep learning curve, but I think I learned a lot. Yes. Uh, the judges there are incredibly bright. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoyed the appellate work. I thoroughly enjoyed my experience doing yeah. the appellate work at the Supreme Court. Some of the people who acted there who were here yesterday were complaining uh, quite significantly about uh, their experience there. So you didn't have any, any experience worth... Uh, with uh, talking about that is unpleasant? Not, not in terms of uh, the quality of my work or the confidence that the colleagues, my colleagues on the bench had. Uh, yes. Some of the senior judges, I sat, may I disclose that, uh, Justice Kachalia, I sat with him on, on, on a number of cases, I think. I apologize. <laughs> it was a thoroughly enjoyable experience, I have to say. All right. Okay. Um, okay. I did. I, I learned a lot from the senior judges. It's a very organized court, I have to say. Yes. They work in a very organized way. Uh, 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 what about the high court? Is it organized or does it still have a long way to, to go before it can, be, it, it, can, it can qualify for that description? No, I think that the state of the high court, the high court that I am in, the Johannesburg High Court, which is one of the la larger, both the Pretoria High Court, one of the larger high courts, the largest high courts, I think, uh, we went from being very, very disorganized when I arrived there as a young judge. And I think through the efforts of uh, um, uh, my, my judge president and my DJ, uh, deputy judge president, they've changed uh, the processes in the court. They've reduced our workload. Um, so I think the work has become more bearable. Yes. Uh, we have a little bit more time to think about what we're doing. Yes. Uh, when I first started and when I was first acting there, the, my very first day in um, unopposed motions, well, they delivered the files to me on a Friday afternoon, basically, at yes. one, 4 o'clock. And the clerk, Mr. Shabalala, the clerk walked in and he brought a bundle of documents about, of about 25 files. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Put that on my desk and then uh, that should be fine. I mean, I'll finish that by, by 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Yes on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning, which is the start of the motion court week, and he said to me, Judge, no, 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 I'm going back to fetch more files. And he went back six or seven times. At the end of that afternoon, I had 380 unopposed files yes. on the floor. And I literally spent that whole weekend on the carpet, in chambers, yes. you know, working up those cases. It was an yes. incredible load that we, that we had yes. uh, in the old days. That's 10 years ago. That has changed. That load is reduced to 60 files uh, per judge 
per week basis. Yes. Is it fair to say you are comfortable now, relaxed, uh, we, can, we can march on? Yes, you may do so. Um, just um, two or three quick issues to, to uh, run by mm -hmm. uh, or run through. There are some two complaints that are related to your judicial work. Uh, the decisions that you took. Uh, in your view, is it necessary to go into any detail in relation um, to whatever concerns people might have about the way you, you decided the matter? Um, uh, Chief Justice, I, I, I presented written submissions to the Commission where I've set out uh, exactly what I did in those matters what interactions I had with my DJP in the first matter, the Satsi matter, yes. um, and why I believe there is no merit in that application. Yes. The matter went on rescission. Um, uh, I think it was Acting Justice um, uh, Claren yes. who, who decided against Ms. Satsi and found she didn't make out a case for rescission. Yes. It then went on appeal to a, a full bench at the High Court, yes. and they also found against her. Yes. Um, and, and I think that basically closes the matter. Uh, yes. I wasn't required to give judgments, sure. uh, give reasons when you give default judgment. Yes. Um, I had given reasons when I made the attorney, uh, uh, made the order on the attorney client scale in the first postponement application. Yes. There were no heads of argument. In the old days, we, were, we, we didn't deal with the matter when there were no heads of argument. Yes. Um, I had given her lawyer ample opportunity to make submissions to me, and he sure. couldn't make submissions to me, and he basically conceded that they were grievously at default. Yes. Um, and that was that case. The second case, I think, has even less merit. Uh, it was a matter I did recently. Um, I think it was the 28th of November in the Labor Appeal Court. I sat with the judge president, uh, uh, Bashir Wagley, and my sister, uh, Violet Patswane. Uh, she was the acting DJP at the time. It was a matter where the respondent uh, basically uh, uh, indicated that the court had no jurisdiction. Uh, we had given the um, appellant's counsel an opportunity to argue, and the, the judgment reflects that the appellant's counsel was given this opportunity to, uh, to argue, and there were certain arguments raised. Yes. The, we had to strike the matter from the roll because we did not have jurisdiction. It yes. then went to the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court basically found that there was no prospects of success in the yes. appeal. The, the other issue that relates to the Constitutional Court, I want to prepare you for it. Yes. You, you have got no reason to be overly concerned. Mm. If colleagues don't raise it, I'll raise it at the end. Very Here well. is the bottom line. Mm. All that needs to be checked is whether you can work well with people, you can work well with colleagues, you can work well with clerks if they are uh, you, you have, since you go going to have clerks assigned to you, if appointed, uh, are you sensitive to their needs? That's all. You don't have to be troubled and be sweating. Uh, it, it is in that spirit. Yes. Don't see yourself as somebody under siege. Uh, at, um, how do I hit back? Just relax. I'm going to give colleagues an opportunity to ask. So, Whatever, even if questions might be difficult, don't, don't worry, just relax. Okay, well. Don't allow that thing to, in, to interfere with your confidence and the way in which you need to deal with the issues. As I said, if colleagues don't raise it, I'll raise it. Uh, what is written down and the other issues that you and I have had occasion to, to traverse relating to um, how collegiality and how to, to relate to people generally. Mm -hmm. Colleagues? Uh, Commissioner Msomi. Sorry, thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, sir. Judge, um, the late Chief Justice Pius Langa penned a paper many, many years ago, and that paper was titled Transformative Constitutionalism. Mm. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with that paper. Yes, yes, I think I have read it, yes. Sometimes in the past. Yes. Uh, sorry, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm, Commissioner, I'm unable to look at you, see your face, because the it, It's Commissioner who's inter... Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm, I, yes. Thank you very much. Mm. Yes. Now I have a clear view. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and Chief Justice, the late Chief Justice, Pius Langer, makes mention of a number of challenges that faces transformative constitutionalism. One of the things that he touched on 
which I would like to invite your comment on, mm. is the legal culture in South Africa, mm. where he bemoans the fact that our legal culture is formal rather than substantive in mm. nature. Mm. Looking back now where we are, have we gone past that stage or are we still a very formalistic legal culture in terms of how we adjudicate matters which become before our judges? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Our, our, our constitution is a transformative constitution. It has as its broad object uh, transformation and, and large-scale transformation of, 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 of South African society. Um, I think when you read the Constitution, you've got to read it with a substantive understanding of that Constitution. And when you apply the, uh, the various clauses in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, uh, it's got to be applied in a substantive manner as opposed to a formal manner. So it's, it's what the Constitution is about is, in fact, f substantive equality as opposed to formal equality. Are you able to share with us a judgment that you have penned where that principle comes through? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yes, I, I haven't had, I mean, I haven't had an opportunity to deal with a, const, a, a, a matter dealing with uh, equality as such, uh, but, but I think, uh, I, I'm just trying to, sorry, I'm just trying to think. Um, You've got, to give the, you've got to give the Constitution, uh, you've, got to, you've got to give effect to the transformative agenda of the, of the Constitution. Um, so to the extent that you're dealing with, with rights disputes, um, I mean, I'm just taking one example of the contingency fees agreements that lawyers used to enter into. Um, they entered into these agreements, they claimed, under the common law, and they said there are two systems of the law. There's the common law and there's... Um, there's civil law systems, okay? Now, lawyers were charging more than what the act allowed them to charge. Oh, sorry, they were entering into agreements for uh, a contingency uh, fee agreements for a percentage larger than the, the act allowed them to, to. And they basically said the common law allows this. But in doing so, this actually constituted a violation of, of the rights of, of, of litigants and in particular poor litigants that were dependent on, on, on the proceeds of any damages claim that they brought to court, in particular the Road Accident Fund Act. So whilst I wasn't dealing specifically with an issue of equality, we had to, we, we, we had to when interpreting the provisions of the Act, we had to interpret it in a purposive manner and with a substantive understanding of that and, and how it impacts on access to justice. The last question, uh, Judge, uh much has been made in this interview about the, what I would call a lesser significance that, given, that gets given to, the, to customary law. Mm. And people are trying to locate where problems could be. Interestingly, when I read Chief Justice Pastor Langer's paper, he talks about our legal education. What is your view? Has our legal education, because that's where lawyers, judges, are in the main produced. Perhaps me, as a 47-year-old, the horse has bolted. But if we are to produce lawyers who are alive to customary law, it should at least start at the legal education that we give to them. What is your comment to that? Yes, you know, uh, Commissioner, there are three graces of the law. There's the common law, there's the civil law, and there's customary law. And customary law has always remained the step sister, I'd say. I think step brothers get treated better than step sisters. So customary law has always remained the step sister. And there's a challenge for the courts to see how we basically subsume customary law into our common law system. So in developing the common law, we need to look at ways of actually subsuming customary law. I mean, in everyday practice in courts, I mean, I sit in urgent court as a senior judge very often this last uh, a term that went by, I think I've sat there twice already, and there are disputes that come before the court that, that, uh, that, that have a customary angle. Take, for instance, a simple thing like a burial dispute, which is very, very important in the lives of any family, 
okay, who has the right to the body. And I've got to then listen to the evidence and I've got to understand from a customary point of view, you know, what are the things that are important to this particular family in deciding where that burial takes place and which family has a right to that. Um, I think, you know, when I did customary law at the university, it was Professor uh, uh, Mandalam Kunu and Professor Vincent uh, Malambo that uh, basically taught customary law to me. And it was a su su subject that was quite separate from everything else, you know. It wasn't seen as a mainstream subject. And I'm hoping that that has changed the universities and it's become part of the mainstream uh, uh, agenda and syllabus of the universities. I'm, I'm sure it has, given where we are now compared to when I was studying uh, pre-1994. So I think there's a challenge for the courts to basically uh, apply their minds to how, in developing the common law, there's a duty on the courts to develop the common law uh, to the extent that is, it, it's inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to develop the common law in line with the values um, uh, in, in our constitution and in, 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 in line with the, the spirit and purport uh, of the Bill of Rights. So I think we really need to look at ways, and I think the Constitutional Court has started looking at this. Uh, recently, there was a judgment of the Constitutional Court that dealt with uh, uh, a claim for damages where the minister of um, the, the MEC, um, I forget the, uh, yes, um, the MEC basically brought, uh, uh, brought uh, the, the submission of the MEC was that he shouldn't be obliged, oh, sorry, it was she, I beg your pardon, she shouldn't be obliged to pay um, the, the plaintiff a lump sum amount of money that given the, given the strain on government's resources that, that should, those payments for, for future medical expenses should be made in uh, periodical payments. And unfortunately for the MEC, she did not make out a case. They were the, the factual matrix was weak. But what the court did say, the court did say that the constitutional court needs now to look at how you can basically uh, incorporate customary law values into um, the common law and how you can develop them as one system of law. Siti, one more. Uh, the Constitutional Court has recently made a ruling, and I'm sure you have read that, that decision, of Long versus SAP. Are you familiar with that decision? I haven't been able to read it. Uh, you haven't read I've it? Been, I've been so consumed. My, my, I had a Difficult, re difficult term at the high court and was, was really so consumed with, with being senior judge that I haven't been able to read all of the recent cases. I have to... Okay. Um, but let me yeah. try and elicit your, your view on mm. the matter. Before, before an employee gets suspended, mm. it has been practiced in our jurisprudence mm. that you must give that employee a hearing. Mm. And for me, the reasons have always been obvious because mm. when you are suspended at work, you have to go home, you have to explain why you have been suspended and so forth. So the, there was a rationale behind the rule that says, before we suspend you, show cause why we should not. And the Constitutional Court now has basically, in that judgment, said it's not necessary. Yes. What is your take as, a, as an experienced labor lawyer? Yes, I, 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 I'm, yes I'm aware of the principle, although I hadn't read the case. Um, and it's actually a case that Mr. Mpofu had brought before me many, many years ago, asking for, I don't think you remember it, you have such a busy practice, Mr. Mpofu. Uh, it was the daughter of the judge president of uh, the court in KwaZulu-Natal, who was suspended without, bringing, without having a hearing. And um, it's quite difficult because there isn't a, there isn't a, it, it isn't a uh, permanent decision, the suspension. And you're also getting paid during that suspension. So, I would think that uh, the, the, the hearing has to come before the actual dismissal takes place and not, not the sus suspension. So I would broadly uh, agree with the Constitutional Court on that, on that case. Thank you so much. Uh, l l just to, to, to touch on that um, um, future medical expenses, <laughs> isn't part of the problem this? that in circumstances where contingency fee is to be paid, payment immediately of everything immediately judgment is made has a consequence of the contingency fee mm. being deducted from 
what is supposed to work in the distant future, with the result that even if you were to die a, a day after payment, the attorney has pocketed what uh, should not ordinarily have been paid at the time. Indeed. Isn't that part of the, yes. of the injustice that flows from, from the system? Yes, indeed, in, indeed it is. Uh, because you do get greedy attorneys who basically pocket 20% 20, 20 of, of the proceeds. Well, there was a time where they're pocketing more than 40% of the proceeds. Yes. And, and thank God to the judgment from the High Court, which was ultimately con confirmed by the Constitutional Court, um, um, a matter that I was involved in with the full bench. But that was the problem. That is the problem that, that ultimately, 10 years from now, the plaintiff um, or the child of the plaintiff finds that there is no money for the future for medical expenses. Well... I heard you make a statement that the, the cust customary law must be subsumed yes, under the common law. Isn't that a prob problematic statement to make? Yes, yes. I should have why, used why should it be subsumed under it if it's, it's, as if it's superior? No, no. I think I used the wrong word. I think there needs to be... They can basically exist as two systems that are given equal uh, 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 importance side by side. Uh, but the word subsumed, thank you for pointing that out. It shouldn't be. It, it was an unfortunate but choice yes. of word. Yes, yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nogesi. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, sir. Judge, um, I want us to talk on access to justice. Yes. Um, would you agree with me that as part of access to justice, time has come that... Uh, African languages be prescribed as part of qualification in a law degree? Yes. Um, I do believe that some universities expect Zulu to be taken as a subject. Um, I suppose it's entirely up to the universities, you know, to keep in times with the, with, with the developments in society and the, transformations, the transformation that the Constitution demands uh, of society to basically offer uh, courses, offer language courses in the LLB and make it compulsory. I mean, there was a time where we had to study Latin, which was a dead language. Um, I don't see any reason why, you know, you shouldn't be required to uh, study an African language. I'm sure you could be given a choice of two or three languages and uh, you could do so. Yeah. What I'm trying to say, Judge, mm. is rather than leaving it to the choice of universities, which is the position now, I'm saying to promote unity, cohesion, and understanding of us building that South Africa uh, that is envisaged in, in the Constitution. Do you think that an understanding of our languages, where we embrace the language used by the majority, would assist in that process, particularly in the application of the law? Yes, yes. So are you suggesting that the legislature basically prescribes this? Um, in the universities' acts, or yes, what I you know, and I think if if I mean, I think that's a political decision, and if, if it's impo if that is what uh, is required, uh, then I think the legislature must go ahead and do it. If that is what the appeal from the community is and from society is, then maybe then perhaps that would be the right way to go. I have no difficulty with that. You know, one can't suffer for learning another language. <laughs> okay. Lastly, building yes. up. Following up on the question by the Chief Justice, um, we know from the past that commercial work in this country has been a domain of the white big firms, mm -hmm. particularly me, I mean, dominated by males. If now we were to extend among the consideration for qualification to be a judge, say in the Concord or in the SCA, that you must have at least a knowledge in the commercial law exclusively, would that not be an indirect maintenance of the status quo where the majority are excluded and the prof I mean the judiciary would be dominated by those old males that have been exposed to that area of the law? Yes, uh, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are very few law firms, small law firms that, that um, have the capacity um, and the skills uh, in commercial law. Uh, the, 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 the young black lawyers 
who are equipped in commercial law are all found in the big law firms. Um, just the other day, somebody approached me uh, to recommend a, uh, a small commercial lawyer. I did find a lawyer to, 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 uh, to recommend, um, somebody whose reputation I know very well, having been briefed by the person when I was in practice. And I did, I did, brief, I did give the name to my colleague to, uh, to brief that lawyer. But she then turned to me to say that, um, that her husband, who's a black person, by the way, black gentleman, said, well, you know, you're not going to find a good black lawyer in the small law firms. You're going to have to go to, the, to a big, large firm. And I said, absolutely not, because I have confidence in this particular uh, partner in the law firm that I recommended. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still not clear on your question exactly. Are you saying that if commercial law is a requirement for becoming a judge, then obviously, yes, young black lawyers are going to be disadvantaged and prejudiced because they haven't been given the exposure that the white lawyers have been given over the years to commercial law. Yes. You want, you want to follow up for me, but the point is, how do we then respond I mean, to such a challenge? Because surely the Constitution requires us to transform the judicial. Yes. Here we meet at this apex court people who are specialized in commercial law and we don't empower. We have a deliberate attempt or actions of excluding them. As you, as you understand, that work is a domain of these big firms who are mainly male dominated by yes. white firms. How do we gap or tap into that challenge? Thank you, Chief. Yes, I, mean, I, I think you're going to have to work closely with, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the law societies uh, in order to change, you know, in order to, to ensure that there's some kind of equitable distribution of commercial work, that not just the large firms are, 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 are dominate that work. There's got to, we've got to make some kind of, I don't know if you can call it structural change. I'm not sure how you do it. But it has to, there's got to be some kind of uh, broader attempt by the legal profession as a whole to ensure that, uh, that, that litigants are not just taking their commercial work to the large firms, because that's the problem now. The litigants have confidence in the law firms. You don't blame them. They have confidence in the big law firms. These are firms that have been established. They, all litigants don't have deep pockets, so they have a, 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 a certain limits uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the amount of money they can use. I'm not talking about big corporates now, but I'm just talking about the ordinary litigants. The, the point is that even, even, even uh, black business people, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, will first go to the big law firms before approaching their brothers and sisters in the small firms. There are some small firms that have made headway. If there's a little firm uh, of, of women attorneys that have made some headway in, in becoming a commercial law firm. They wanted to be very other small uh, six or seven partner law firms. But it's, there's got to be some kind of composite effort in the profession, actually, to ensure that this changes. And, and perhaps, you know, some kind of involvement of government, government in it as well. Because even government, I'm sorry to say, Chief Justice, will brief the big law firms uh, in anything commercial. Well, if, the, if, if people are left to be comfortable, that's what happens. Yes. But tell me, why is it that uh, it, it doesn't look like black practitioners, in a ger generic sense, <laughs> at, at an attorney level, are, are willing or able to establish big firms? What in your experience seems to be the problem? You see three, five coming together, you get excited before you know it. Everybody's going their own way. What is the problem? Yes, I, I don't, I, I really, I mean, we, we had discussions around this many years ago, I remember, well, split the bar. And I found that very successful small black firms basically were happy to be, to be part of the big firms and basically sold themselves over to the big firms. And, but I couldn't understand because these were small established firms and all they had to do was basically come together. And yes. I think the late George Maluleka tried to do that 
at some point. Well, Siriti and uh, Musenek uh, Mavundla yes. tried, but it yes. didn't last, eh? It didn't last. And Busiello also tried. Busiello, mm -hmm. Lekabe, I forgot, and who else? Mm -hmm. But it also didn't last. Yes. Mutlante, yes. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, and I mean, I, I, I think it was about, Hola. I do believe it was about getting the work and getting the right kind of work to be able to sustain those large practices. And yeah. unless unless those opportunities are created and you're getting a, uh, a segment of the work that's going to those big, well, I, I don't know if I can still call them big white law firms, but that's what they still appear to be. Uh, unless the little black firms are getting a segment of the work and unless Moseneki and, and Mavundla got a segment of that work, it wasn't, they weren't able to sustain those practices. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that was the, it's the sustainability problem and it's the ability to actually attract that work. Well, in passing, I was excited at some stage, but also aggrieved somewhat when former Deputy Chief Justice Mosenek said he was going to quit before time to establish a huge law firm of uh, mainly black practitioners and women. Yes. I thought it was going to be a good thing. My only worry was why live early? <laughs> uh, people will think that there is tension between us when there is none. Yes, um, Commissioner, did you your follow-up? Thank you, uh, Chief Justice. Uh, good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, Ms. It Minister. was more on the issue, or on the question that was raised mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Commissioner Nojesi. I just wanted to know your view whether you don't think that um, universities may not have a role to play, particularly in developing commercial law, so that it's not something that other people meet with when they are already in practice, but it becomes part of the generic Yes. Uh, training. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly think that, um, I mean, in, you know, in, at universities you now have these experimental, experiment, sorry, what is it called, uh, sort of applied legal studies uh, or, or experiential, um, uh, for, for, say, take pension law or take labor law, you'll have, le you'll have the legal aid clinic that's, you know, or, uh, or in pension law you may have uh, 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 you know, um, students that are basically doing cases in pension law and basically developing their skills. Um, I don't see why it can't happen in commercial law, absolutely, you know, where you can have little clinics around it, so students are then getting practical experience. I and mean, I think that's a criticism uh, that's been directed at universities for a long time, that by the time the, 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 the young students uh, come across to the bar, or those that come directly to the bar or directly to the, to the attorney's profession, they come with very little practical experiential skills. And, and I think, in as much as we can criticize America for lots of things, I think the exper experiential programs are fantastic because they'll have it in, for instance, pension law or old age law or uh, uh, homelessness law, where the students are actually getting practical training. And, and, and we've done that by having our little legal aid clinics there and in, and in our applied legal studies units, uh, where those units are also involved in, in litigating on issues, constitutional and other public interests, gender issues, et cetera. Commissioner Mpofu. Uh, th thank you, uh, CJ. Uh, I'm going to come back to, the, to this issue of, of commercial law and my second question. But my first question is uh, around um, the issue of gender-based violence, mm. which I regard as one of the biggest sketches in this country, which is not uh, spoken about. It's, you can even describe it as a silent killer. Um, and I'd like to, you to maybe say what you think, not just the judiciary, but the justice system per se. Uh, can do A, to highlight this issue and, you know, mainstream it. Uh, make sure that preventative measures are taken and uh, empower uh, victims to, to, to bring it to the fore, you know, give exemplary sentences, you know, a whole comprehensive thing because this is something that, again, we cannot talk about equality. The promise of equality and the values of equality and dignity in the Constitution uh, can never be realized if uh, something so entrenched and literally, I mean, complete violence. We, we hear all the statistics about 
There was some statistic we had yesterday. I uh, can't remember about what, about 50 cases a day. I'm quite sure that when we talk about gender-based violence, we go into the hundreds of, of, of incidents per day, both reported and unreported. How can um, the justice system broadly and the judiciary more specifically uh, play a role in, in, in highlighting this issue and combating it? Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, it's a big problem and it's a, really, it's a real scourge in society. Uh, gender-based violence, rape against women. Um, it's something that the judiciary can't do on its own. You know, a lot of these, all of, a lot of these cases go to the magistracy uh, to be heard. Uh, but even the, between the magistracy and the judiciary, that can't be dealt with. It's got to be, you know, it's the police that are involved. It's the forensic uh, laboratories that are involved. It's, it's broadly uh, obligation on government, basically. And, and, our, and our courts have said, the Constitutional Court has said, and the, and the High Courts and the Supreme Court have said, time and time again, this is a violation of the rights of women, and, 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 and this issue needs to be dealt with urgently um, in, 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 in order to reduce that incidence of that, that kind of violence, in order to change that mindset. So, unfortunately, there's only so much that a court can do. It can give down exemplary sentences, but at the end of the day, it's basically all aspects of society that need to work together. It's this government, it's, it's all of the government agencies, such as the police, services, uh, such as the forensic laboratories. You know, the problem is that when cases come to us, we are now ready to adjudicate on the case, but very often we do not have the evidence there. So if there's a woman, if, the, if there's 15 rape charges, very often you'll find that the state hasn't done a proper investigation in relation to the 14 charges. Um, and, and I think that is the problem. That is the problem that perhaps Greater tra training needs to happen. There needs to be workshops so around this issue uh, within government departments so there's a greater urgency created. Society needs to know that government is tackling this issue, that government is serious. It needs to eradicate that kind of violence. It is just not acceptable in a society that has the kind of constitution such as ours that protects the rights of women. And, 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 and a, a, a constitutional court that may has made holdings to that, to that effect. Yes, just as a small follow-up. I mean, okay, apart, uh, all right, I suppose that's for the justice system, but society in general. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I, I'm asking this question is I have a specific example. Somebody, a friend of mine showed me a picture of her sister who had been oh. hacked with an ex, I think. But uh, that's what the, 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 the guest looked like. And, you know, so I said, oh, well, this is terrible. I'm sure what happened. I'm sure the guy is in jail. No, she didn't report it. Yeah. Why? Be because she has three children. This, uh, this person feeds the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently the conversation went something like this. Well, if you say I must report it, are you going to feed my children? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, that level of, uh, now we're talking about the unreported, the unreported incidences, apart from the thousands of reported ones that we know. Yes. What, what can be done? Yes, it's, it's, it's this thing called the dependent syndrome. Um, you kind of get, you're so dependent on, 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 on the male person in the family because he's taking care of the, the, the needs of your family and your needs, financial needs, that you, you, are, you reduce yourself to a state where you're prepared to just accept this. You know, uh, Mr. Mpofu, I have to tell you about a program that the uh, judges in, J in Joburg and Pretoria are involved in, mm. uh, in particular the women judges, and they're doing it via the um, uh, International Association of Women Judges, the South African chapter, and, J and Johannesburg has its own chapter. It's got a, a sex and gender-based violence program, and uh, some of you may be aware of it. And basically what they did a few months ago is they went out to schools in Sebokeng, and, and basically targeted three, 4,000 students and started to educate them through role play on, on, on why that is not acceptable, why gender-based violence is not acceptable, whether it's meted out against a woman or whether it's meted out against a gay person or generally a man, why it is totally unacceptable and it shouldn't be form part of, 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 of our society. It's very important, and, and, and I believe that it's very important to start changing the mindset 
of, of young school-going children. Because once they realize at that age that this is not acceptable, they'll be grow, they grow up into adults that will have respect for the rights and dignity of women, and vice versa. The women will have to, uh, respect for the rights and dignity of men as, as well, or whether it's gay and lesbian people, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, if, uh, if we can go to this uh, commercial law thing. Mm. I just want to ask you a few questions about it. We've had this morning from mainly Justice Kachalia mm. that there is apparently uh, some complaints in some quarters, including uh, academic writings, about the fact that the Constitutional Court lacks uh, commercial expertise and a fear, I suppose, that maybe when we make the appointments here, the, that uh, problem might either not be addressed or worsened. Now, firstly, I, speaking for myself, I think that the, the, such a complaint is, um, uh, must be rejected with contempt. Uh, but firstly, the, 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 I think that the, the first thing I want to deal with is, is the myth of this thing of commercial law. What, what is it in the first place? Uh, you have commercial law is supposed, I suppose, to deal with those aspects of the law that deal with the business community, you know, commerce and industry. Isn't it? Yes, company law. Uh, yeah. yeah, all of those areas. Yeah, mm. but so it's if if it. that is the case, uh, a person who has expertise in labour law, for example, mm. is that not commercial law? Well, there are there are certain commercial angles to it. I mean, I think, you know, we we shouldn't be seeing law as law in distinct areas. Um, ultimately, the, the 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 constitution filters through all areas of law. So no but, area of the law is basically protected from the constitution. Yes. And, and so even if you take private law rights, for instance, contract, etc., I don't see why the Constitutional Court has no right to basically intervene if there's a violation of rights in so far as a contractual dispute between two parties are concerned. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, uh, what I'm really getting at is more something like this. If, mm. if, if you have to adjudicate as a judge mm. a contractual dispute mm. between an employer and an employee, mm. What's the difference between that and uh, uh, adjudicating upon a contractual dispute between Anglo-American and MTN? Mr. Mpofu, we, we all know, we all got, went to the bar, we all practiced, we got, area, we got work in vast, different areas of the law. We were all not skilled in those areas of the law. I remember getting my first competition law matter and I nearly died. But I decided I had to work this matter up and I had to research and I had to apply my mind to it. Yes. And I was given other matters after that. This, you know, it's the same thing with commercial law. Yeah. Uh, we all have the skill. It's to be given that opportunity. And unless you're given that opportunity, you'll never develop the skill. So, for instance, the Joburg High Court used to have something called a commercial court in the past. And, and Judge Kachalia will know of that. But there was the criticism of that commercial court that really the old, the, 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 old, the elder judges, basically. The, the old white the males. The old white males. Yeah who came in from the big law firms of the bar with that commercial experience, that work was basically, uh, it was their little terrain, yeah. really, you know, protected area of work. And that work wasn't being distributed to other judges, and in particular, uh, judges of color. Uh, what my judge president has now done, it's, it, he has reintroduced this commercial court. Yes. So the, the, the difference here is that these are matters we've been de dealing with. These are uh, matters under the company's law, co company law matters, such as business rescues, uh, insolvencies, et cetera, and other commercially related matters. So all that, the, the idea is to attract the law back into the courts, that the cases come back into the courts and they, they are not given out to private arbitration. So that's the idea here. So what, what this practice directive promises uh, the commercial uh, practitioners is that you'll get, you'll get to set your matter down earlier than you would have if you came on the normal motion roll, opposed motion roll. But the idea is, and then some of us were critical of it, and you said, JP, but you're going to be introducing this commercial court, and we're going to go back to a system that you had 14 or 15 years, and that's unfair, because you are never going to be uh, ensuring that, that skill, those skills are, are distributed around the court. Yes. And he said, Faiz, I, I assure you that will not happen. 
there is no, it's, you, you're not basically uh, uh, creating work for a small group of commercial lawyers. Yes. Uh, judges. And do, do you know of any university course, LLB course, that does not offer company law and those kinds of mainstream so called commercial law, contract law? Those are all mainstream courses, yes, yeah. that are compulsory courses. And is there any lawyer who, 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 who specializes in all areas of law, or who knows everything no, about the law? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Isn't, isn't the real issue, what we're testing here is the JSC, your ability to adjudicate. We can ne and never assume that you know every piece of legislation under the sun or every area of law but that you are capable of looking it up when you are need, it's needed uh, to, be, uh, to be found, that you know the procedural rules, you know how to conduct a court, and you know, you know how to find the law. The law is simple. If it's the law of purchase and sale, what are the elements? It's one, two, three. I might have forgotten what they told me in first year, but I can find it. That's the, the, the bottom line, isn't it? Indeed, indeed, Mr. Yeah. Porfu. And, uh, and, and also, I think a point that you've made, isn't it true also that this, um, this thing about law of insurance, law of this, law of this, law of that, actually, you know, is, is all, it's just about teaching. It's about so to help us to teach the law so that we, we can't just say we're just going to teach you the law. But ultimately, there is one system of law, and it works along the same lines Either there's legislation, there are rules, this you must do, you, may, you must not do this. If you do this, you will be punished. If you don't do this, you will not be punished. It doesn't matter what, what area of law it is. The rules of the law are actually the same, yes. isn't it? And, and whether it's, 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 it's regulated by legislation or by the common law, it's the the same. Court, either the courts are giving you the gu guidance, and in so far it, is, it relates to company law, for instance, the courts are also giving you that guidance because they're constantly interpreting that Absolutely. law and giving the guidance to, to practitioners. Yeah. So, so that's, I think the, yeah, the myth of the so-called commercial law needs to be buried. The second issue is that that complaint, in my view, is itself ideologically uh, loaded. Because have you ever heard of anybody complaining that the Constitutional Court Something must be done about the Constitutional Court because uh, nobody there is a specialist in criminal law. Never. <laughs> so, exactly. The, the point is that, therefore, I mean, I'm sure the prisoners in the prison uh, will <laughs> complain that the, the, there's no uh, criminal expertise in the Constitutional Court, but they're not going to get access to the law journals yes. and, uh, you know, and all sorts of conversations uh, in high places and complain about it. So the voice that will be heard will be of the, so the powerful so-called commercial lobby. Irrespective of the fact that I can put money now, there is probably 10 times more commercial expertise in that court than there is criminal expertise. But yes. nobody will complain. Nobody will say there's no, there's a shortage of road accident fund expertise in the, in the Constitutional yes. Court. Yes, so yes Mr. Mvofu, if, if you look at the composition of the Constitutional Court currently, you have lawyers there with vast experience, uh, lawyers who practice commercial law, lawyers that were public law practitioners, lawyers that had varied practices. And those lawyers spent many years as judges, getting experience in a wide array of, of cases from, from, from various aspects of the, you know, uh, um, the law. Um, so through their years, as, even if they didn't get that experience as practitioners, through their years of being at the High Court, and I, I have to say, in, particularly uh, if one has um, uh, regard to the judges in that court that came out of the Joburg High Court, they would be fully equipped with commercial law experience. Thank you. Just, Just in passing, I, I hear you say you had pleasant, uh, pleasant experience in the SCA. Yes. So you didn't come across some of the problems that we've been told about uh, in the... Con you didn't come across the top six? Uh, the top... <laughs> well, I came across the top six, yes. Okay. But I, I basically stayed in my office and carried on doing my work. I didn't want to get involved in the politics. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think I was told by my JP, just go there, keep your head down, and don't get involved in the politics. But sometimes, unknowingly, you are involved in the politics. Yeah. Uh, because there's something called gossip and rumor, and people yes. assume things about you that are completely untrue. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chief Justice. <laughs> Commissioner Norman. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Judge. 
Good afternoon, Ms. Norman. Thank you. Um, between 2006 and 2010, you were a director um, at Wexman's mm -hmm. Advisory Services. Mm -hmm. I just want to understand how did you then address the matters that you raised in your 2004 article, mm. eight years at the bar, um, uh, around briefing patterns. Now you're a director at that law firm. What did you do for that four-year period? Yes, um, I was a director, but I was still not an attorney, so I didn't have the power to brief directly. But I, very, I, I always recommended young lawyers from the bar. Um, you know, in, in, in matters that we were working on, I always recommended to the partners that were working with me, uh, ju juniors from the bar that they should be bringing into, uh, into the matters. Um, I belong to the Transformation Committee um, at, Worksman's, uh, uh, at Worksman's, and I also belong to the Pro Bono uh, Committee. I was the co-chair of the Pro Bono Committee. I also sat on the executive. So uh, for me, it was very important to ensure that that composition at Worksman's changed as well. So I would encourage, I would, I would, I would go out there and I'd encourage young black lawyers to actually apply uh, to Worksman's, so to increase the number of black lawyers. Uh, there, were, there were a number of black attorneys, uh, sort of article clerks, uh, junior members, et cetera. But every time I had an opportunity, I would try and encourage a young black woman, a young black man to come into the, uh, to, to, to basically apply, not just to Worksman's, but to other law firms. Towards the end of my time at, at Worksman's, I decided that there was a reason for me being there. There was really a reason for me being there. So I thought it was, I had never been an attorney before I became an advocate. I did a fellowship at the Legal Resources Center, but that was a fellowship. In those days, that was not, the Law Society didn't accept that uh, as part of the, 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 uh, the uh, candidacy program. Um, so it was important for me, it, it sort of gave me, I started to see things differently as well. I started to see things from the perspective of an attorney, and I started seeing things from the perspective of an advocate. Um, it was, I also, my, my exposure to attorneys had increased fivefold by being at Worksman's. And I knew that when I go back to the bar, I'll probably have a far better practice than I had when I was at the bar. And it was important for me to put in place some kind of program that young women juniors from the bar with under two years experience and well, women and men from disadvantaged backgrounds, that they have that kind of exposure. And I then, um, discussed this with, uh, with Advocate Patrick Gumshaulana. Uh, I think he may have been the head of the, no, I don't think he wasn't the head of the Johannesburg Bar. I think he was just, the, uh, he had just finished his term as, as, as uh, the chairman of the bar. I had discussed this with him and uh, there, was, there was the impediment that the general counsel of the bar wouldn't allow advocates to basically practice out of the same uh, building as, 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 as attorneys. So we had to overcome that difficulty of that particular rule. So. I went to the Johannesburg Bar, I made a presentation to the Johannesburg Bar on how this would work, and uh, they then were happy with it, and they then said to me that they'll put it before the general counsel of the bar. So that, th th that uh, proposal was then presented to the general, general counsel of the bar, and the general counsel of the bar accepted that proposal at that point. So that gave young women and, 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 and uh, uh, um, male juniors from disadvantaged backgrounds to basically spend a period of, I think, six months at the law firms. This would give them an idea of how attorneys think. When you're working up a brief, don't just work up a brief in a vacuum. You need to think, well, what does my attorney need in this brief? You know, am I doing what is needed for my attorney, or am I just doing something that's not relevant? So I think if you understand what attorneys need, if you understand the thinking of attorneys in these big attorneys' firms, uh, there's, a, there's an element of ruthlessness as, as well uh, that's accompanied with, with these big commercial uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions, lawyers, etc. So it was, the whole idea was to expose these young minds, you know, these, these young lawyers uh, to work in the big firms, which will also help them when they come back to the bar within six months to a year. You know, it will generate some work from that law firm. Yes. Yes. So, just, uh, I'm, I'm more interested, really, and thank you for that answer, mm. but I'm more interested in knowing um, the results of your efforts at the time when we were still with Wexman's mm. as a director, they, mm. um, I would like figures thrown at me mm. that, uh, for instance, there's seven juniors, black juniors, that during that period, um, they were assured of getting work 
through your influence at that time? That, that's basically what I'm really Yes, I, I can't in. say exactly how many juniors, but there were a handful of juniors. I wasn't, most of the work that I was doing was not work that was, they were briefing counsel out for, because I was in the firm and I was, I, I did a lot of work for multi-choice. So I was working out in Africa, um, you know, the different countries in Africa, working on, on, on broadcasting legislation uh, and, and doing other regulatory work. So there were times that I wasn't here. But if I was involved in a, in a mergers and acquisition or a, a mergers under the Competition Act or something, you know, there were times where we brought in, we brought in three or four young juniors that the firm wouldn't ordinarily brief. I can just think of one example, um, and that was Hamilton Maneci, and Hamilton is now a fully-fledged com competition lawyer, you know, uh, a very respected senior counsel at the bar. Uh, I'm just thinking, uh, and there were, a few other, there were a few other juniors as well, but I wasn't directly involved in the briefing as such. Um, but I tried to influence this as much as I could. And where I could suggest uh, juniors, um, I, I would do so, yes. Uh, so can I accept that then, except for my NHC and two others, those are the figures that we're looking at? No, no, I can't, I can't say that that was exactly the figures. There may have been more. I, you know, it's, it's not like I go to the EXCO and I said, you have to brief these five people today. You know, somebody will say to me, is there somebody you can suggest? And I say, yes, there's a handful of lawyers. Why don't you contact these, these three or four lawyers? And, 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 you know, then they'll come back and say, yes, we did one of them, and she's worked, quite, worked out quite nicely or whatever. I can't give you figures. It's been a long time ago, and I didn't at that time think it was necessary to actually. But what I tried to do was put in place a kind of a, a program that I thought, you know, under the kind of leadership of the VAR uh, would ultimately benefit. Yes. Uh, Young okay. Juniors. I think let's move on. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Um, I see um, at page 60, you list there, uh, I would imagine these are most the companies that you acted for, um, and you've identified them as significant matters that you're dealing with. You acted for NESPAS in the merger between NESPAS Electronic Media, Mnet, and Supersport, and then you also mentioned multi Mnet Multi Choice South Africa uh, and Multi Choice. And you were doing, as you've already indicated, you were going all around Africa. But my question then, this was 2006, 2010, and you, you would have regarded these as your major client, so to speak. Um, because you must remember, you were a director, this advisory law firm. So very different from someone who's not a director in that company and someone who's simply practicing from the bar getting instructions separately mm -hmm. from, from an attorney. But, but what I want to understand is these you would have regarded as major um, uh, entities that you represented. Yes, they were, they were broadly, you know, I belonged to a unit, uh, which was the Broadcasting Telecoms Unit. And those, when I arrived at Worksman's, these were Worksman's clients already. Mm -hmm. And I made it quite clear to them that I'm an advocate and I have no ability to basically attract work. Uh, so. I was basically, you know, so I was actually working as an advocate in the unit. So, you know, when papers needed to be drafted, et cetera, I would actually be doing that. I'd work up heads of argument, um, et cetera, yes. Yes, and then last year then, you were involved in a matter when you acted at the Constitutional Court yes. that involved multi-choice. Yes, yes. And you, you ascribe in that matter. I was ascribing that matter, and I found against multi-choice in that matter. No, yes. no, no, that, that, that's yes. not where I'm going. Oh, sorry, yes, I was ascribing yes. that matter, yes. Yes, what I want to understand is, um, do you think it was appropriate for you to sit in that matter, having had multi-choice as sort of your client or represented them for many years, 2006 to 2010, did you regard it as appropriate for you to sit in yes. that matter? Uh, I didn't think it was, it was a problem because I had... I had, it was already nine years later from when multi-choice was my, was my client, and I knew that I was able to disabuse myself of the relationship I had with multi-choice. I had no contact with multi-choice. I had, I had asked when I went to the high court, uh, I had asked of my DJP, what happens if a matter uh, comes to court and worksman brings that matter, or multi-choice is in that matter? And he said, Faiza, Faiza, in the first few years, I think you shouldn't be dealing with those matters, but later on it will become possible for you to deal with those matters because you will be, have the ability to disabuse your mind. You will be more senior. Um, it's yes. like I disabuse the mind of a whole lot of other things. I mean, there are practitioners that appear before me every day that I would have known at the bar, you know. Um, yeah. And I think the, the, the legal fraternity is so small that we constantly um, in contact with, with, yeah. with practitioners that we yeah. were. But you see, you know. that's, a different, that's a different point. Yes. 
it relates to whether somebody appears before you or not. This is something that deals with the measures that we were dealing with for multi-choice at the time when you were not a judge. Yes, yes. So the question that I'm asking is, looking at it now, it was not nine years later, it was 2018 when we yes, had the matter. Yes, yeah. Do you believe that it was appropriate for you to sit in a matter which is similar in terms of the issues, because it's a major issue, as I, as I see it. Yes, it was. Um, yes, and I mean, the, if you're comfortable that, look, you had no reason yes. to be worried, you were happy with it, that's basically. Yes, yes, I had absolutely no reason. I didn't, you know, I didn't think there'll be any reasonable apprehension of, uh, reasonable apprehension of bias. If multi-choice felt that way, they could have approached the court. I was one member of the court. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there were 11 other judges that were there to keep me in check. I have no dis discomfort at all. It was such a long time in my practice that I had absolutely no discomfort dealing with it. Well, um, another argument can be raised that somebody can say you can easily have reduced yourself because there's lots of judges there who could have had the matter without you being there. Indeed, but I didn't think it was necessary at the time. I really didn't think it was necessary okay. at the you. time. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you so much. Um, you participated in meetings of the executive at, uh, is it Verkman's? Yes, yes. Didn't you see it as an opportunity in the very least to influence the policy direction in terms of the approach to briefing rather than uh, allowing yourself to be approached to recommend as and when it becomes necessary, became necessary, mm. to influence the mindset in appreciation of the bigger picture, and say, yes. at executive committee uh, meeting level, say, people, you need to be part of the solution. Yes. There is a need to give work to black practitioners. Didn't you see yes. that as, a, as an opportunity? Yes, I think, and I think it, I did say it. I think I did say it from time to time. And, and, and individual lawyers would basically tell us, I'm briefing this lawyer, I'm briefing that lawyer, and I'm, I've, you know, I've brought in a second baby junior. They were very involved in that second baby junior program as well. So they, very often, if they had a male, uh, a white male advocate that they were briefing, or a white female advocate, um, with a white woman or a white male junior, or a black male junior, by the way, they used a lot of black male juniors, and I often, I often made it quite clear that it doesn't help to just bring in a black male junior and have the black male junior sitting there and doing nothing. You know, you've got to basically ensure that you, that you, that you, you get the black junior to be involved in the matter. Uh, so we used to, you know, I, I think we had these debates, and there were lots of other black uh, attorneys uh, on Exco with me, and, and this was something that was raised from time to time, yes. The was there a change? I, I asked I, because I, they, they yes. asked me to address them about uh, two years or so mm -hmm. ago. And I raised these issues very squarely with them yes. because I saw some progress, but it wasn't quite there, yes. considering the size of that, uh, of that firm. Yes, indeed. Was there some significant change, or was it marginal? When I left there, I think it was marginal. I think it was marginal. And I used to have discussions with my colleagues, uh, Sandile, and, yes. and um, you know, about it. Um, other, uh, uh, some of them had left and gone back, gone to the bar. But we had these discussions. We often had these discussions about, about briefing patterns. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ndlama. Thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, Judge. My question relates to Commissioner's, um, so Ms. Customer Law One with reference to the protection of customer law in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You have your Section 39.2, which requires the development of, of customer law. You have your Section 211.3, which requires the application of customer law. But come to Section 8.3, there's no mention yes. of customer law when it comes to its application yes. uh, by the courts. Yes. So your opinion on that one? Yes, but... but, but the courts are, um, are required. You know, customary law is, is, forms the central part of our constitution. Uh, the constitution basically gives, gives it the same importance that it gives to, to, to the common law and the development of the common law. Uh, sorry, the section you, you referred to was 83. Eight. I beg your pardon? Section 8, section 3. Oh, so, oh 39.3 you're talking about. 
Oh, section eight. Oh, okay. Let me just look at that quickly. Sorry. Uh, Oh, yes, it talks about developing the common law. You're quite right. And it doesn't refer to customary law. Uh, but I think customary law is dealt with focally in 39. Uh, yes, I understand that. I mean, this was obvious, obviously, you know, at the time of drafting of the Constitution. Um, it says, yeah, in order to give effect to the right in the bill, it may apply, yes, and develop the common law, may develop rules of the common law to limit the right provided that the limitations are accordance, yes. Uh, this is the application clause. That's, yes, it doesn't make any reference to, to, to customary law. Um, but it doesn't mean that in the application uh, clause that common, the common law has no standing. It's really, it really forms a central part of the, of the Constitution. That is the critique of the, of the Constitution relating to the protection yes. of customary yeah. law. Customary law. Uh, yes. yes, because it may lead to some of the inconsistencies <coughs> relating to the application and interpretation of customary law mm. in addressing issues that emanate uh, from it. Particularly when it comes to remedies, mm. because you you find a judgment mm. that emanates from customary law. But in terms of remedying now, <coughs> the issue that is emanating from customary law then a common law principle will be imported by the court in addressing this customary law matter. Mm. I was just putting that one to yes. you. And I think I said that earlier, that customary law seems to be the stepsister of the common law and the civil law. And, 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 and I think it's a challenge for the courts, and the courts need to they apply their minds to customary law and customary law remedies. Um, I think that's certainly a challenge for the future for the courts. Um, and I think there's a degree of importance that's now being placed, there's a realization that, that in as much as the common law must be developed, there's it also customary law um, that, that, that needs to be recognized, uh, to be given effect to. And yes, Gee, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Justice Kachalia? Yes, thank you. Judge, uh, I am I have a duty to put uh, a few questions to you, and I understand that in so doing, the criteria with which I approach the question of a, the suitability of a judge may differ from some of my colleagues, my mm. fellow commissioners here. Uh, but it is my duty to assess your suitability in terms of those criteria and not to respond to any comments or to, to subject you to a debate within the JSC about, about what, what the accurate criteria will be. So with that in mind, I want to deal with the question of, of uh, commercial law and, and uh, commercial skill. Mm. Now, the, uh, I understand that uh, uh, the judge president of, of your division has introduced a, a commercial court. W would, you, would you like to uh, explain to the, uh, the, uh, this, this body how you understand, how did that need arise, and w why was that done? Yes, I, th I think I think for a while the judge president has been trying to basically uh, attract commercial work back to the court um, in the numbers that, it, that there used to be in the past. Um, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, a lot of the commercial work has gone to arbitration. And I think through his involvement with the law firms and talking to the law firms, the law firms gave him certain undertakings that you know, if you can tell us that we will be given preferential treatment, for instance, not preferential treatment, but, but, but we will be guaranteed a court date earlier than three years from now for our commercial matters. Um, and if you can, if you can, if you can uh, guarantee us um, that, that your judges are not becoming equipped to deal with, with commercial law, then we'll be happy to bring this court work back to the court. And I think that's where it started. I think for the last three years or so, he's been having these discussions with big law firms. Um, and I think before he even 
suggested it to the judges. Uh, he first had these meetings. Uh, I think he also did it in conjunction with the bar. So, so big, the, you know, so the big movers and shakers at the bar, the leaders of the bar, could also influence the law firms to basically start bringing their work back back to the court. And that's where it started. So there's now a commercial court practice directive uh, <laughs> that, you know, if you bring the, the, the matter to the high court, that matter gets case managed. So there's compulsory case management um, on that matter prior to it actually uh, uh, being, so the, the, sorry, the judge that's allocated the matter will first case manage the matter, regardless of whether it's an application or, or a trial. And uh, some matters that are very large, his, you know, he, will, he will allocate that matter to two judges. So the matter can be case managed together by two judges, but those two judges then have the freedom to decide whether they want to sit together in the matter as two judges or whether one of those judges should deal with the matter. Yes, so, I mean, so as I understand it, there are really, the, the, the real concern has been that uh, uh, significant commercial disputes are increasingly being diverted from the courts to arbitration. Yes. And that this leads to an impoverishment of our law, our commercial law, mm. because there's no proper system of precedent that develops. Mm. I should just say for the record that, that I think that your Judge President's decision is a bold one. Indeed. And I think uh, is responding to, to the real needs, uh, uh, certainly in, 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 in the Johannesburg area. So I wish to follow up uh, uh, from that. I mean, would you do, it does seem that you had some uh, commercial experience both in your practice and, and, uh, and some experience as well in, uh, as, as a judge, uh, both of, of, of the high court and when you've sat in appellate courts. That, would that be accurate? Yes, I did, I did, yeah. uh, yes. Because uh, I've seen that too from some of your judgments. So do you think if you were appointed to uh, the uh, Constitutional Court, if this body makes the decision to recommend your appoint, uh, to appointment and the President ultimately appoints you, that that skill that you have developed uh, will be of benefit uh, to the court, or do you think that that skill is really irrelevant from the point of view of whether or not you are a suitable candidate for appointment? No, I do believe that it's highly relevant, particularly given the, the extended jurisdiction of the Constitutional Court. Yes. So, as, as I said, all matters are basically impacted by the Constitution. Uh, and, and provided it's, it's a matter of, uh, 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 what is it, the word used, uh, a, a matter of sufficient importance. Um, and even though it doesn't have a direct constitutional angle, there's a duty on that court to basically consider whether or not to grant leave to appeal in it. So I do think that it's important to have women, members of that court, uh, you know, that, that have broad experience. Um, I think commercial law experience is important, but I think experience broadly is important as well in other areas of the law. Yes. I do believe that I will be able to, 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 to make some contribution in that area of the law. Yes. yes and in other areas of the law as well, actually. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Norman. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Um, I'm sorry, Judge, sorry. I just, following up on Justice Kachalia's yes. question on this uh, newly constituted court, mm. uh, the commercial court. Mm. Um, out of the 300 odd matters that you dealt with them with one week end, would you say they were all commercial matters? What were those matters A large about? percentage of those matters were commercial matters. And then, and what, what's the other bulk? What uh, was the other? Evictions. Yes. Um, I would think it would be evictions. It would, yeah, most it would mostly commercial matters, you know, yes. and, and matters under the National Credit Act. Uh, but otherwise, liquidations, insolvencies, offers to compromise, company law stuff. Yes, uh, I would say I would say sixty percent probably sixty yeah. percent. Yeah, and and RAF is a big is a big um, thing yes. in in that court. I know. Yes, so. And, so the bulk largely. I mean, if if there's court roll on on oh. on Mondays, it occupies the whole day. Oh, yeah. Yes, and is there a special court for that? Uh, well, what, what has happened in the past, the, uh, in the last, I'd say, if, you, if you're looking like six years now going backwards, or five years going backwards, the trial role was made up of literally 90% of RAF matters. There were just a few, there were a handful of commercial matters 
uh, that, that used to come to the court. I'm told by my colleagues on the Commercial Court Committee that that has now changed. And I've already picked up two commercial matters in the last four weeks. You know, I'd barely finished the one when I had the second one yes. already. And, I, and, and, and we are required to deal with these matters not in the normal role. Uh, we first case manage it and then we approach the DJP or the JP to give us uh, a space um, in the role for the next term or we deal with it in the last week of term. So it's almost like we're taking on ex additional responsibility. And the judges have been obliging to deal with it because all of them want to get this, this added experience, you know, and broaden their knowledge of the yes. law. Uh, uh, Yes, Judge, I understand, but look, it's, it's not my place to, to suggest how a court should be run. Mm. But my concern is when particular law firms can actually get this kind of, um, they go to the JP, they say, we'd like another court. If you're going to give us your judges, then we'll bring the work back to you. Mm. I mean, that, that's a concern for me. Yes. Um, because now it means that if you have money, you are business, you are big, you are large, you can be accorded a, a court specifically for for me to deal with your issues as a court, that, that's really something that's bothering me. Yes, no, it's not as crude as that, uh, 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 Ms. Norman. It's, it's really, there's a definition of commercial work, and there's a committee. There's a committee of about six judges that decide whether that work constitutes commercial work. They will then decide whether it should be dealt with under, uh, 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 the, 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 what, under the title of commercial work. So yes. it's not something that's done arbitrarily. A litigant can't approach the DJP directly or the JP and say, ha ha, we want a date tomorrow, you know. No, 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 that's not mm. what I'm suggesting. Mm. What I'm suggesting is that we've got other pressing litigious matters mm. within the country, mm. all right? Now, we, you've told us, this is, this is what you've told this committee, mm. that these law firms said, the JP must have said to them, look, you're taking away all your work, you're arbitrating on your work, you're not bringing it to my courts. They must have given their reasons. Yes. So the JP is now, and these law firms, they say, okay, we'll bring it back, provided that your judges are going to deal with them expeditiously. Mm. You've got backlogs, possibly, in criminal matters, I don't know, but there isn't a committee that deals with RAF matters and assess them and allocate them, deal with criminal matters, assess them, allocate them, deal with eviction matters, assess them and allocate them. So my take is that these commercial matters are being given preference simply because we want to, uh, to retain this work within the court and also the, the, the special allocations that are given to them for me do not um, suggest that there is equal treatment of litigation that is before the court. No, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with you all at all, uh, Ms. Norman. There is, there, and I think everything has is, is got its place and everything is given equal treatment. Um, for instance, all RAF mat matters get case managed as well. There's a, there's a court that deals with the case management um, of RAF matters, and before they can even get to court, they have to be case managed, uh, they have to meet certain requirements. So there is, you know, it's, it's not, there's no... It, the, uh, the JP is not putting, placing lesser emphasis on RAF matters or of evictions or anything of that sort. All of these matters, RAF matters, the trials, will get dealt with in the trial court. Um, that court sits every day. Matters are allocated every day to 15 or 20 judges. I mean, this is how big the trial roles are. So, so each day, each hour, matters are being allocated. So that, that, that work is not being neglected because special attention is paid to to commercial matters. The, in the commercial matters, for instance, if I was given a commercial matter today, um, there's no date for that hearing. I first have to contact the parties. I have to get them together. I have to case manage. It may take me four weeks or six weeks to case manage that. But there's no time built into my work day to case manage that. I have to find that time in the morning, late afternoon, at lunchtime, over the weekend, to case manage it. I could even do it telephonically. It's when that matter is ready now for hearing that you could either put it, if I'm a senior judge in a post motion role and I've got an hour space or a two hour space, I will try to fit that into that space. If it's impossible to do so and I need a full day or I need two days for the matter, then you approach the DJP and you say you need a special allocation. So it means he's got to give you, set aside a full day for this matter, like any other special motion that you have in our court. Uh, so everything is given equal attention, nothing is, no, nothing is being neglected because at the end of the day, we've got to serve 
the litigating public. And I think we do that very, very well. I'm not suggesting that at all. I am really not suggesting that, Judge, with respect. You are the one who told this commission about the special court, special commercial court that has been set up. I'm following on, on that. On that. Yes, yes. And you have not told us about any other special court that has been created. It's, 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 it's not a special commercial court. It's, it's, a, it's commercial court that gets dealt with through a practice directive. It is the same court and it's the same members of the court that will basically be allocated work, uh, commercial work. It's called the commercial court because it's a term that was basically brought in from the past and maybe that's the wrong term and perhaps the, the, the JP can look at that uh, and, and the committee can look at that. So, I, you know, it's, it's really one way of to deal with this problem that we have that black practitioners, black lawyer, black members of the judiciary do not have commercial law experience. And it's really one way. So I think the objective of this was not only to, to ensure that these commercial matters of the big law firms are given preferential treatment. That is not the objective. But ultimately, the broader objective was basically to equip the judges in the court with commercial experience and expertise so that when they go to our appellate, appellate divisions, you don't get the criticism that Mr. Mpofu has referred to, that you've referred, referred to, that, Mr. that uh, Justice Kachalia and other commissioners have referred to. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Norman. Maybe to, to intervene before Commissioner Mpofu comes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just to give a perspective. I was approached by the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales for courts that have commercial courts, jurisdictions that have commercial courts mm -hmm. to come together, work on a joint program so that we can facilitate the speedy resolution of uh, cases of a commercial nature. At a heads of courts level, <clears throat> part of what we did, apart from having previously then as Judge President Blambo whose court deals with most of these matters. To give me a name that I could uh, send to serve in that committee mm. of the Commonwealth jurisdictions um, that deals with commercial courts, we then decided that there is a need to fast track certain cases. Some commercial matters, labor matters because of the job loss implications, RAF matters, and a, a sexual offenses matters that come at, uh, at a higher court level. Um, give those of them that desire, deserve to be prioritized priority and fast track them. It's not certain ones, but a wide range of matters that commonsensically would appeal for expedited uh, attention. And that's how this... Uh, uh, that's how this whole uh, concept uh, came about, of course, coupled with the need to, um, uh, to be a bit more robust in the implementation of uh, judicial case management. Um, uh, so so if, if anywhere it functions in a matter that, manner that, for instance, seeks to project certain judges as super judges or allows for practitioners to, to, to dictate what should happen, what should not, then it's not uh, the correct way. But uh, the judge president is not to, to blame. Uh, the system stems from um, a discussion mm. uh, by a collective of the, of the heads of courts. I thought I must just uh, make that intervention Thank so you. that some perspective is given to where this thing comes from. Commissioner mm -hmm. Mpofu? Th thank you, CJ, for the second bite. Uh, it's just a follow-up. The, the, um, which judges uh, sit in this commercial court? Uh, no, no, no. All the judges sit in the commercial court. All of the judges have an opportunity to be to sit on these commercial matters. There's a committee of commercial court. So there's a committee that basically decides uh, whether these matters constitute commercial matters. Yeah. They will then refer it to the DJP, who will then allocate it to judges equally. Who's in that committee? Uh, judge von der Linde is yeah. on that committee. Judge uh, Unterhalter. Mm -hmm. Justice uh, Modiba is on that committee. Mm -hmm. Lebo Modiba. Justice Tina Suwendu is on that committee. Mm -hmm. And I think just Judge Motajani is on that committee. Right. Yes. And they do the sifting? Yes, they do the sifting equally. They all have equal responsibility for doing right. the sifting. Okay. Well, you know, my concern is this. 
and I'm glad the JP is here sitting behind you. So I, since I can't address him directly, <laughs> I'll address him through I you. Know yeah. uh, yes. Whatever the merits or demerits of this system, the unintended consequences must be watched out very carefully mm. because this is going to get us back to this uh, um, problem, to use a neutral word, of uh, the so-called commercial bias and myth. Mm. I'll tell you why. The, the, the reason why um, work left the courts to, the arbitra uh, to arbitration mm. was not necessarily the speed of adjudication. It was partly motivated by racism, crass racism. Mm. As soon as the courts started to become uh, black, then the so-called commercial law firms and commercial clients had an exodus from our courts because black judges are assumed to, be, uh, to lack expertise. Mm. In, that is the subtext in this whole discussion. It is that black people are assumed at face value to not to have this so-called commercial expertise. I can tell you now, speaking for myself and many of my colleagues, that that myth is wrong. I can stand up against any advocate in this country in any matter, commercial or otherwise, and defeat them as, as we, we always do in court. But what you can defeat them a hundred times. The following day, it's going to be assumed that they have the superior commercial expertise. And if this court, whatever the good intentions uh, of its institution, is going to perpetuate that myth, then it must be abolished because we cannot have racism uh, intruding into this system through the back door yes. of so, of so-called commercialization. Yes, Mr. Mpofo, I think you know. I think the JP had these debates with the judges. Um, certainly, I had asked him, "Is this going to mean we're going to mirror the system in the past, where basically?" you had the leading sort of white lawyers that came into the, the judiciary and they basically dominated that work. And I was completely opposed to it. And he said, no, I assure you that that is not what happens here. And I even asked, I didn't ask him directly, but I spoke to somebody in the committee and I said, but now if you're telling me you're allocating this matter to two judges, that means you're allocating it to a senior judge and a junior judge, that means, you know, it, it makes me think that you're allocating it to experienced white judge and a junior black judge. Um, and, 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 and that's not, not correct because the junior ja black judge is always going to be seen to not have that experience. And he said, absolutely not. The whole idea of you can have two judges case managing the matter because it's a large matter. It probably needs the, 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 uh, um, it needs the, uh, the, the thinking, uh, the contribution of two judges. But when it comes to the hearing stage, those two judges can decide whether they want to deal with it as two judges or whether they want to deal with it as one judge. I mean, I was also very careful. I was very critical of the old system. I wasn't at the court when the commercial court system started. Uh, and when I came in there, I also felt that feeling that you have, Mr. Mpopu, because there was a day where I was also seen as somebody that had no commercial experience and discriminated against for that. I, I, I was talking to my husband last night, and, and he was a director at uh, one of the, the big parastratals, and we were not in a relationship at that time, we were friends, and he's, one of the attorneys phoned me on his instructions to, uh, and I was working at the Legal Resources Center, uh, to brief me in a matter, and it was a matter that was a 60 bil million rand matter for a little uh, uh, public interest lawyer who was with one year experience at, at a public interest law firm. I had a complete fright of my life, and I said to the attorney, and I should have never done it at that point, I said to the attorney, I'm so sorry, I, I really don't have the expertise to deal with this matter. You really need to brief somebody with more expertise. I'm a public interest lawyer. And it was the biggest mistake I made. I should have just been robust, yeah. and, and my male, any male colleague of mine, even a male colleague in, in a public interest law firm, would have taken that matter, would have grabbed that matter and, and worked on it. And, and I learned from that never to refuse a matter that you think that you have no expertise in. Because ultimately, you will gain that expertise by when the opportunities are created for you to get that work, you will work up that matter and you will bring your, yourself up to speed in that matter. And I strongly believe that whether you have the commercial experience or you don't have the commercial experience, every judge in my court, when they're presented with that matter, they will basically work up that matter and, 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 and be ready for it. And we have, we, have, we have other judges that you could go to for advice. I mean, we have an open door policy, you know. So 
from time to time, you will have a, a, a young acting judge come into your office to say, listen, I have this matter, do you, do you want to advise me on how to approach this, or I'm having difficulty in the case management. I mean, it's an open door policy. Johannesburg has fantastic collegiality, Ms. Mbofu. You appear in that court all the time. It's, I've, I, I said, I said so long, uh, not so long ago in my DJP, uh, there was a birthday celebration for his 65th birthday, and I said, I've been to most of the courts in the country, I've sat in all of the appellate, appellate courts in this country, and I have to say, the collegiality that, that we have in Johannesburg is amazing. And I actually have to thank, and the praise must go to uh, uh, JP Malumbo, who's here today, and DJP uh, Mojapello. There was a time where, when I first came to the, to, to the bench, uh, there'd be little black circles of, 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 of members of the, the bench sitting in little corners, not because we, were, we, were, we, we didn't feel comfortable sitting with uh, the, jo the Maya Joffies of the world or the Bleedens of the world. It was because we were comfortable. We had things to discuss from court. Or, and then my DJP would come to us. He'd say, Faiza, you're a new judge. Please go and sit there right between uh, just, uh, Judge Joffie and uh, Judge uh, Schwarzman, for instance. You know? And I, and I know when the, when the JP came to Pretoria, the very first time I went and I sat in Pretoria, it was, you were sitting in, in, in one was, you know, you were sitting in a white area and you were sitting in a white, in a, in a black area. Homeland. And I thought, my God, this can't be so, you know, in, 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 in 20, 20, 2009. And that changed very quickly when DJP Malambo arrived. When you go to the, to the tea room in, at, the, uh, at the Pretoria High Court now, people are sitting all over the place, and nobody has a name to a seat. And it's fantastic. I mean, I think the transformation in the two divisions, the collegiality, um, I think the, the empowerment programs, the education programs. We, we've just, last week, the JP and the DJP launched this fantastic facility that no other court has. And it's not even thank you to the Office of the CJ or thank you to the Department of Justice. It is really thank you to the contribution that the practitioners have made yeah. and the creation of trust that uh, JP Malambo put in place. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Fortunately, I know the JP does have um, an open door policy, mm. so we will engage him on mm. this. But just as a parting shot, the, the, the continuation of this arbitration uh, uh, flag for, mm. for, for castigating black judges continues even after retirement. Because what happens is that the, the judges who get into the arbitration panels are the retiring white judges. Mm. The black judges who leave practice having done uh, the, uh, the com so-called commercial work still do not get appointed. So it's very clear that the intention of this arbitration is to retain the white system as it is and to ensure that these uh, white churches are followed through even after the grave, so to speak. Yes, indeed, And this I agree cannot with you. be allowed to continue. I agree with you. Um, yes. Uh, you would recall uh, Commissioner Mbofu's concern relates is linked to what used to happen in the past. Mm. As a commercial matter, if find a, judge, a, white, a black judge presiding, the matter is postponed and uh, maybe settled. Mm. So he's cautioning against that. But those uh, members of the panel, aren't they junior people? Yes. Or have they been, I mean, Untold, uh, just, Untold has just has not even greeted us. <laughs> he's knocking. How did he, uh, how does it work? I, I, I don't know, uh, Chief Justice. My JP is sitting here and he'll tell you it was, he decided. He, yeah, between no, him and no, the it DJ was DJ just DJ. my curiosity. Yes, uh, yes. And yes, Judge uh, uh, Matojanis was seven, eight years there? Yes. More what than about, me, I'm about nine and a half. He's nine and, and a half, ten, okay. Ten what about um, the former SC that you mentioned first? Uh, from the Linder SC, yes. He's, for uh, how many years? He's probably there for about four years, I would think. For four years? I would think so, yes. But he's already uh, in charge of that structure. Uh, he's the chairman of that structure. He's the chair? Yeah. But he's junior to Matujan. I believe he's junior. Yes, he's definitely junior to Matujan. Okay, all right. Now, let's just round it up. I'm glad that you have uh, sailed through without any interruption, without feeling that anybody is attacking you because you can never be here to be attacked. Mm -hmm. We want people to be free and to feel that uh, they were given the opportunity to demonstrate their capabilities. Let's just touch on a, 
on the constitutional court related mm -hmm. issues. You would recall that at some stage you had occasion to come and see me mm. because I expressed concern about your behavior as it was reported to me by the court manager mm. that before your letter of appointment came, you came to the court and you occupied chambers and no. demanded records and, no, no. Uh, and what else did they say you demanded? I think they said you demanded uh, parking bay. <clears throat> what no. then happened was I, 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 I was shocked. I contacted uh, Judge President Lambo, happily he's here, I said, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, Judge Katrice Tilwane has been recommended for appointment together with Judge Colapen. We waiting for the president to appoint. Judge Golaben has never come around here, but we are, the court manager was troubled and even thought it necessary to call me and say, hey, there's a judge here who's occupying chambers. What's going on? Uh, that was the first incident that you and I had to talk about. Two. Can I, sorry. Do you, do you, no, no, I want you to deal with the two because they okay. are interrelated. We'll come to the other one last. Mm. The other one related to an incident where when we had conference, which is really the Constitutional Court uh, mm -hmm. judges meetings. I was going to the meeting, I, I met then acting uh, Deputy Chief Justice uh, Ngabinde, mm -hmm. leaving. I said, my sister, where are you going? He said, I understand there's a, a judge, Katrice Tilwana, is, members of staff don't know what to do. She's here demanding this or the other thing, so I must go now, but they don't know how to handle her. He said, she says, she's a judge, she's here to work, she's a judge of this court, and so. I said, but I haven't even told you people anything because the issue of her appointment, I discussed it with the former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Moseneke. I was yet to brief you as soon as the president is appointed. So you then came to see me, mm -hmm. to say, well, this is uh, what I understand, I didn't do this, and mm -hmm. so on. But I said, uh, I made it clear to you, I was, I, was, I was disappointed because my attitude was, whether you're a gardener or a clerk, you never report for duty until you are appointed. And the reason why Judge Colapen had not reported for duty was because he had not yet been told that the president had signed. So, so you had the opportunity to explain. Can you just clarify that? Yes. Because it troubled me and it troubled colleagues. We say, how? Oh, it it yes. never so happened. What is this new yes. development? Uh, uh, Can you uh, just uh, yes. uh, uh, clarify it? Chief Justice, I, think, I don't think it's entirely true what you've just said now. Not all of it is true. It was, I, my JP had tell me, told me the appointments would be made by the 1st of June. It's like, it's when we go to the SCA. Oh, oh, you are not saying I'm not telling the truth. You are saying no, I was no, not, not told the truth. Oh, no, I was saying you, it's not entirely true. What, so I'm, t I'm telling you my version of it. So my JP told me when he called me. You didn't call me. My JP called me. I was in Cape Town at the Labour Appeal Court, the 1st of June. I, I didn't call you. I spoke to the JP. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so when the 1st of June came and I didn't get an appointment letter, I wondered what happened. So I phoned... Uh, Judge Motajani, because he had been to the court before. He had acted in your court before. I said, Elias, what am I supposed to do here? Because it's the 1st of June. Um, I've just finished at the Labour Appeal Court. Am I supposed to get records now or whatever? He said, Faiza, you know what you need to do is you need to just go to the Constitutional Court and speak to the, to the court manager to establish from him what is happening. So I went very humbly. I'm sorry, I didn't demand any parking. I, I went very humbly. I was trying to establish what the situation was. And it's based on my experience from when I'm a Labour, Labour Appeal Court and a, and a Supreme Court of Appeal judge, acting judge. We, on the first of the day, or the day before the first, you get all your records in your chambers. It gets delivered to your home, it gets delivered in your chambers. Ahead of time. Ahead of time. And this was really just the query. And I, and I said to at least are you sure I must go there? Because I don't know if I can go there. You know, do you think it won't be, be okay? And he said, yes, just go. Perhaps Judge Inkabinda is available. At that point, 
uh, you were not, I think Judge Incubendo was the one who basically recommended that, that, that I be, I'd come to the court as an acting judge, and I was very grateful for that. And it was done, done in that spirit. I didn't demand any records. I was just asking, are you aware of when the appointment is going to be made? Because as I understand the Supreme Court Appeal and the Labor Appeal Court, we get our records ahead of time, and when it comes to that first day of the beginning of term, we start, you know, we start working. Um, and and, and I, then he said, okay, let me go and see. He says, I think Judge Inkabinde may be on her way to the conference. I said, no, no, please don't. I don't want you to be disturbing Judge Inkabinde if she's on her way to the conference. You can't call her out of conference. He said, no, 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 but I think I may be able to catch her at the door. And then he came back and he said, Judge Inkabinde has gone to conference. And he said, we will let you know. He said, go back and wait until we get a phone call, until we give you a phone call. And I never got a phone call. And then Judge Colopin and Judge, uh, uh, Judges Colopin and Zondi were then appointed. And I wasn't appointed. And I called my, D, my JP to say, JP, I haven't been appointed. You know, so he says, no, 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 but the CJ had told me that you, are, will, that you will be appointed. Your name was on the top of the list. So I said, yes, but I haven't been. So maybe pres perhaps the president has decided against appointing me. So I then went off. I wasn't, I was going to cancel my overseas holiday. And I then decided, said to my husband, let's just go on holiday anyway, because I don't think this is going to happen for now. And, and I then went away, and then on the morning of coming back, no, and then some point while I was abroad, I got an SMS from uh, Justice Turon. Uh, no, no, I congratulated Justice Turon to say, congratulations, I've just heard you've been appointed. And, uh, and then she said, I thought you were coming to the court. You know, we're having a conference tomorrow. And I said, Justice Turon, we're not, we, we haven't been, I haven't been appointed yet. Uh, and I left it at that, and I, then on the Friday before we were going to leave, Friday or Saturday, I received the Johannesburg roster from my JP on email. And when I looked at the roster, I'm saying, oh, but my JP has forgotten to put me onto the roster, you know. And I said, so my husband said, but maybe you are going to be appointed to the Constitutional Court. I said, okay, the moment I get back to South Africa on Sunday morning, I will call my JP. As it happens, the moment the plane landed and I put my phone on, bing, the first email that I saw was an email from the JP saying, you are appointed. Uh, the, the Chief Justice said he's made arrangements for you, for you to receive your papers. Uh, I, I, think he's, he, I think he said to me, call the secretary. So I then called your secretary, who said to me, he will establish because he hasn't received an appointment letter yet. So I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, what shall I do now? He said, no, no, just wait for the appointment letter. And, and that's what I did. I, I never ever went there and demanded a parking. I've never demanded a chamber. Judge, so, so basically, uh, when I phoned him, then he said, he said, arrangements have been made for your clerks to put files in the chamber, he said to me. Yes. So I said, are you talking about the files that I'm going to be allocated? Because I've really only got three days to read up. And the first yes. matter was the Salem matter, which was 30 volumes. And I said, I've only got three days to read up. He said, yes, yes, that's why the appointment, matter, the appointment letter hasn't come through. But I'm saying to you, you can go to Nomsa uh, Mumfusi, She's got all of the files, and the clerks have the files, and perhaps you can take them away. So when I went there, uh, Judge Nschlantla then came downstairs, and Schlantla came downstairs, and she said, yes, yes, this will be the chamber you, you're occupying and stuff. Take the documents away from, ho from here. Take whatever you need to read immediately, and then just wait for the appointment letter. And that's exactly what I did. It was, I didn't throw a tantrum or demanded anything, yes. and I made this quite clear to you at the time, C. Yeah, Justice. because ordinarily, when a person demonstrates the eagerness to work, mm. it's something to be celebrated. Yes. And, and I wouldn't have had any problem with you saying, my, my hands are itchy, mm. give me work to mm. do. Mm. That, that's the right attitude. Mm. My only challenge was the manner in which it was reported to me. I mean, people were, 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 were shocked and frustrated. That's why I said, yeah, there's a particular order that needs to be followed here. What's going on? But that's your explanation. Yes, and that, was, that, that is it. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, if you ask clerks in the chamber or Namsam Fufi, I went there very humbly on that first day. I didn't even know what to do. You know, and, and Namsa said, come, 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 come. Let me sort you out. And she moved the desk around. And I said, no, no, don't do anything because we still don't have the appointment letter. And then Judge Nflanta came down and she said, no, no, Faiza, okay, let us sort out your office. So by the time the appointment letter comes and you have to start on Monday, your office will be sorted out. And she's that kind of person. But I, see, I really wouldn't have. I mean, I wouldn't have done it in the SCA or the, the Labor Appeal Court anywhere. Yes. And having been in those courts, I would have never, never demanded. It was Judge Motojani who said to me, go and see, and they'll let you know what's happening. And I went to the court manager, you know. Now, I'll be very careful with the last matter. Mm. I, I don't think we should go into the many details. I'll be very careful how I raise it because 
essentially. I just want to establish whether, if appointed, we will be able to work together and the constitutional court community will, comfortable, will be comfortable and be treated with the respect and sensitivity that they demand, regardless of the level at which they operate. So just understand that's, that's where I'm coming from. Yes, indeed, JP, I have been, I've, I've worked the high court, I've had as many as 10 clerks through my nine and a half years at the high court, nine, yeah. five, nine years at the high court. There've never been any complaints for my clerks. I'm okay. very interested in their development as leaders, as young lawyers. I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very committed to improving the standards of work, both of myself and my clerks. Uh, a, it's a steep learning curve for them. I enjoyed my time at the Constitutional Court. It was such a pleasure to work with the young clerks at the Constitutional Court. I, 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 I also said to my, my clerk at the High Court, I said, it's, it's amazing because these young clerks have the ability, they know what is happening in your head because with every consultation that you, that, that you have them present at, you are debating issues and you are discussing issues and they understand the whole thought process behind you arriving at a particular conclusion in a matter. It was such a stimulating time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed those consultations. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful time. I think the clerks that you have currently there even have more access to the judges um, than we did when we were clerks at the Constitution. We operate more as a family. You operate as Families a family. Families within the bigger family. Absolutely, you operate as a family. And, and I was happy to be, I mean, I have, one of the clerks from the court that was there in 2017 is now my mentee. She's no longer at the court. I have employed, uh, I think, two, two of your, your, your the clerks from that court um, as senior researchers in my research unit. You know, uh, both are black, both are highly, highly able, highly competent. Uh, there have been no complaints in the high court about my ability, my collegiality, my ability to work with other judges. And, and I have that ability uh, to do so. I, I'm, an open, I'm an open person, an approachable person, and I pay particular attention to development of young people in my court. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Sometimes there is a thin line between being firm, being a disciplinarian, and going overboard. Mm -hmm. And that's what I just want to establish. Mm -hmm. Is it true or not true that when one of the clerks was unwell and needed medical attention, mm. you denied her the opportunity to consult the doctor, insisted that she gets antibiotics, and subsequently said for those uh, antibiotics that you gave her, she must pay 689 rands. No, it's entirely untrue. It's entirely untrue. And, and, and Rafiwe, I think, has yes. made that clear. And the one about being in hospital to undergo an operation, the one who was on sick leave, mm. is it true or is it a misrepresentation of what happened mm. that while she was there on the verge of being operated on, you called her, her blood uh, pressure wet, shot up, and the nurse even had to, to drop or cause her to drop the, the call because otherwise she wasn't going to be fit for a medical operation if uh, that engagement between you and her were to be allowed to continue. Yes. Indeed, I think that clerk has made it quite clear that that's untrue as well. Uh, she was, I had been notified by, I had agreed to give her the, I, I don't agree to give the, the leave. I had nothing to do with, 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 with determining whether or not she goes on leave. She indicated to me that she's going on leave for four weeks. It was a five week reading period. Uh, I, was to, I was asked by the secretary the one morning, she said, you know, judge, I think there's gonna be a problem because Rafiwe did not put in a leave form. So all I did was I phoned her and I said, and she wasn't, it wasn't, she wasn't on her way to theater. We had a very nice conversation. I wished her well. The ailment she was, was, was she to, in hospital at the time? She was, at the, she was going to the hospital, I think, at the time. Or I can't remember quite clearly. But we had already had a long consultation. She, the, the condition she was going to be, uh, to have an operation on is the condition that I had. So we were talking and, and counseling each other, you know, telling her about when you recover, what needs to happen, etc. Because I treat them like, like my own. I treat them like my own. So I was giving her advice about all of this. So when Nansa raised this issue, and I thought, oh, my, I hope Rafiwe doesn't get into trouble by the fact that she hasn't put in a leave form. I only discovered after that that you actually don't need to put in a leave form. All you need to say is you're taking leave.
But, but Rafiru has made it quite clear that this was a, 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 an exaggeration and not entirely true. I did call her. Yes, I did call her. But she didn't say to me she was on her way. There was still time before she goes into the operation. She said to me, she said, Judge, yes, yes, yes. I didn't think that that was necessary. But I will talk to my sister, and my sister will make sure she then submits the, the leave form. I'll sign it, and then she can submit the leave form. And that was the end of the, 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 the conversation. You I wished ended, her well. You yeah. ended the conversation. The call was not dropped. No, the call was not dropped. All right. Yes. And also, um, the allegation that you shouted or screamed at them uh, and, and they even considered resigning because the situation was just made unbearable for them, is, is it uh, correct or incorrect? It's incorrect. And I think all of the, both NAMSA and Refuse's affidavits make it quite clear that that was incorrect, that I never, ever screamed at anybody. Um, I certainly never screamed at anybody in court, and I think the judges that were present in court on that day made it quite clear that they never saw me screaming at anybody. It was just, it was just unhappiness over a set of heads of argument that I did not receive. Yes. And, and, and I couldn't understand what caused the young woman to basically uh, react in the way she did. And the second clerk then basically realized, after that memorandum came through, that a lot of it was lies, and wasn't entirely true, and was just an absolute exaggeration, yes. and petty, and, and, and trivial, and, and she made that quite clear in the letter of support that I've given to yes. the Commission. Yes, although she's not specific about yes. uh, where yes. the exaggeration lies. Yes, yes. But uh, I would like to say that I had, I had dealt with this matter extensively with Justice Japtan and Shlansha because it worried me terribly, and I had then, the matter was then escalated to Judge Zondo, and we spent many, many hours talking with him. He also spoke with the two young women, he spoke to the secretary. She's also submitted a letter saying that I was a pleasure to work with, that I don't scream at people, that it's just not my way of doing things. I've, I don't do that in the high court. I'm stern, I will ask you to do something, I will give you instructions, because I believe it's not for me you're doing that, you're doing it for yourself. So, so yes, so, yes. yes. You want to complete? No, 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 I just, okay. I do think that it was, it was resolved before yes. Judge Zondo. Okay. And I, I, I demanded, an inquiry. I said, Judge Zondo, I'm a young judge. I'm not in the appeal court yet. I'm not in this court yet. This thing will resurrect itself and visit me some, sometime later, and it's going to destroy my career. And I cannot allow that to happen. By that stage, I had already been uh, appeased that Rafilwe uh, wasn't the one who wrote that memorandum, that the other clerk wrote, basically drafted that memorandum without her consent and without she having an opportunity to basically look at it. Uh, and, and, and consent to the allegations in it. Um, and, I, and I wanted, a, I, I really wanted a, an opportunity for this to go to an inquiry. And Judge Zondo promised, he said, Faiza, these are just misdirected young girls, they misguided, uh, you know, and, and, and there was the sensitive aspect to it, which I won't raise now in public, but uh, he just said to me, you know, even her mother is not going to, uh, is gonna probably give her a scold about it, yes. you know. Do not worry about it, it is sorted out, Rafiwa will come back and work for you. And then Rafiwa came back to work for me. And we worked beautifully. And she hugged me and she kissed me. And she said, sorry, Judge, I'm so sorry for putting you through this. When Judge Mokoro came to the court, one of the court functions, I said to Judge Justice Mokoro, I said, Rafiwa is my clerk, Justice Mokoro. And Justice Mokoro said to Rafiwa, Rafiwa, Faiza is my baby. She was my first clerk. I still care about her. And Rafiwa and I held each other. And I said to, to Judge Justice Mokoro, Rafiwa is my baby, Justice Mokoro. She's my baby. And we've, we've maintained contact. While I was writing my judgment, uh, which, which, which I had to still continue while I was outside of the court, Rafiwa was there to help me at all times. You, you see, just before I, 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 I put the last two or so questions, I just want to give a perspective to mm. this. How you treat anybody, mm. and that's the, perp the reason behind these questions, mm. how you treat anybody whether it's a member of the security department, the cleaners, uh, points to your mindset in relation to the rights that people are entitled to enjoy. Mm. So, so that's where we're coming from. Everybody deserves respect, everybody res deserves courtesy, and even when a reprimand is called for, it is within those parameters that it has to be expressed. I hope you understand yes. where, where, okay, yes, all right. Yes, okay. yes, I, I, like I said, Chief Justice, I haven't had any problems with any of my other clerks. 
There's never been, there's never been a complaint at the High okay. Court, at the Labour Appeal Court. I worked very closely with the, with the researchers at the Supreme Court of Appeal. I've never had it. And I said, I said in my letter to the Commission, I said, I do not know what motivated a young person to basically attack a superior in the manner that she did, especially a young person that's got at the beginning of her career. Uh, it, it, it's completely unprecedented. I was so hurt. I spoke extensively to Justice Cameron about it. He knows exactly how I felt. Yes. yes. Now, this uh, other clerk yes. did not continue with you, Ms. Mlokoti, yes. who is uh, uh, President Meyer's daughter. Yes. She, she never came back to you. No. Was it her choice? Was it uh, your preference? Was it uh, an agreement between the two of you? No, no, she, uh, Justice uh, Zondo had spoken to her separately. Uh, I, 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 was well, I, I would have liked for her to come and chat to me. Uh, she didn't make the, 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 the effort to come and chat to me. Um, at some point, I thought she is going to come and chat to me. And I even said to Judge, Judge Mishlanchi, I think, I think Wella is going to now uh, basically uh, uh, come to talk to me and probably apologize, and I'll be happy to have her because Rafiwe is back, and we're working so well. I actually loved working with Wella. I love working with Rafiwe. Uh, Justice Zondo said to me, perhaps it's better uh, that we, we, we move. I, I also, I felt a bit hurt. I felt hurt that if somebody could do this to me, then how, how can I have her in my chamber? Uh, it was a short while. It was about three or four weeks that had to go. Um, and Rafiwe was happy to come back. I said, I'm happy to work with Rafiwe. We'll put our heads together. We'll buckle down and we'll finish the year off. Uh, and Namsa assisted as well. I think uh, uh, Wella was reallocated to just um, to Justice Jafta. Is there any reason why the Clark's committee, mm. comprising Justices Jafta and Mtlantla, could not resolve this matter to the point where it had to be escalated to the Deputy Chief Justice? I actually don't know. He just, just they normally resolve yes. these uh, yes. apparently small things. I, what I, what, I what think, was so complex yes, about this? I, I, I think that that. Uh, I, I actually don't know. I think it just became. Some, I think being the daughter of the of the head of the Supreme Court of Appeal, I think that also had certain. Uh, I think uh, took the matter to a different level, um, and I really wasn't happy to 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 not have this matter dealt with in an inquiry. I really wanted to because I felt I've never had this happen to me ever, ever, ever in private practice on the bench, and I couldn't allow this to happen. I needed, I needed to know, and I needed a finding to be made that those things were not true. Sure. And, and, I, and I wanted that, and I think that's why it had to be referred to Judge Zondo. Yes. Justice Zondo. And, I, and I'm very grateful for him for the, for the time that he, he, he took in basically uh, talking to all of us. Yes. And finally, if anybody were to say mm. that you wrote an email suggesting that any judge mm. had a particular attitude in relation to the possibility of you being appointed to the Constitutional Court. Mm. Would that be correct or incorrect? If any judge wrote an email about... No, the, if yeah. any, anybody were to say, mm. you wrote an email mm. <clears throat> saying a particular judge, mm. doesn't mm. matter whether at the Constitutional Court or wherever, mm. <clears throat> just to put it more bluntly, was determined to make sure that you never get appointed to the Constitutional Court. No, I've never written an email to that effect. You, you never... I, I, no, I didn't. I mean, I, I said that. I, I said that because that was what... And I... And I, and I, I, I well, I have to say it outly. I, I, the, I, got, I heard from the morning that I asked to see Justices Jafta and Shlanchla about the letter. Uh, my, my, my secretary came to me and she said, Judge... Rufilwe is crying. Rufilwe is crying in her chamber. So I said, why is Rufilwe crying? Because this is what Rufilwe and Wella have done to me, you know. And, and she said, no, no, Rufilwe is crying because she says everything in the memorandum. I said, oh, how do you know about the memorandum? So she says, no, Rufilwe has pointed it out. She's crying about it. And, 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 and then Nomsa is saying to me that she heard that one of the clerks saying that Rufilwe will, Wella will ensure that I never, ever get appointed to the Constitutional Court. And it worried me, and that's why I had to elevate it to Justices Jafta and, 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 and uh, 
Yes, but yes. you never accused any judge no. of an agenda to ensure that you never get appointed to the Constitutional no, Court. No, I've never ever accused a judge of doing that, no. Thank you. Yes. Um, Commissioner Singh? Yeah, thank you, Chief Justice. Mm. Just a short uh, comment. Uh, good afternoon, mm. uh, Judge. Uh, Chief Justice, not only was this matter escalated to Justice uh, Judge Mklantla and Jafta, but it was escalated to us because uh, uh, until late Monday, Sunday night, we were getting correspondence, uh, Judge, from, from different quarters. And even last, uh, last night, uh, there was batches of correspondence given to us. And I just want to say that it's very important, as, uh, as you said, Chief Justice, for cordial relationships within the court environment. And that uh, you, know, you lawyers, uh, and I'm saying with respect, talk about the Audi Altrim Partem rule. And I'm just reminding us about that as well. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Commissioner Nyambi. It, it, it's, it's one thing, uh, CJ, about the letters that we have received. Uh, the response to objection of Ms. Tzatzi. Mm -hmm. In the second page, it's even talking about a copy of the transcript of the hearing of 27 July 2019. Mm. July 2019. No, no, no. July 2015, I think. July 2015. So it tempted me when I was listening to how the CJ was trying to assist you so that you can assist us to be very objective in dealing with these issues. Mm. What will you regard as your weakness? that we have to work on? I think I'm a firm judge. I think I'm a firm judge. I'm a frank judge. Um, and, and I think sometimes uh, people assume that your frankness means that you uh, are demeaning, but that's not, that is not what, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't want, I'm, I'm a very straightforward judge. So if I'm not happy with the product that you give me um, as a clerk, then I'll say to you, please, please go back and, 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 and work on this aspect and that aspect and that aspect. Uh, and that's how I am. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, I expect clerks to basically get involved in the debate, um, in the discussion. I, uh, in court, I'm seen to be a firm person. Um, I did in that matter what every other judge would do. I gave the advocate an opportunity to explain to me why there were no heads of argument and to, to, to basically tell me why I shouldn't make the attorney-client cost order. Uh, sometimes I think, you know, you, uh, litigants uh, feel that, um, th that you're too firm. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it is, what it, what it is sir, but, but, but we all have our weaknesses. We're all human beings. We have an incredibly large load of work, uh, and especially if you're the senior judge. And if, if litigants don't come to court prepared, if litigants don't follow uh, the practice directors, if they don't follow the rules of the court, they have to give the court a proper explanation for this. And, and, if, and if they don't give you a proper explanation, there'll be consequences. And, and that's how all matters are dealt with. I didn't treat Ms. Satsi any differently than I would treat um, any other litigant. She expected me to treat her differently because she was an advocate um, uh, of the high court, and then she was an act acting judge before that. Um, all litigants are supposed to get equal treatment in a matter. Do you regard being firm as a weakness? Sorry? Do you regard being firm as a weakness? Being firm as a witness. Weakness. A f yeah, well, I don't think, I mean, I think as a judge, you need to be firm, uh, uh, pr provided you are, uh, you are fair. You need to be firm and fair. I don't, I don't see firmness as being a weakness, sir, not at all. My question was, what is your weakness that you can be assisted to work on? And you said we are a firm judge. Yes, so that yes, is why I'm, I asked, yeah. do you regard being firm as a weakness? No, no, I don't regard firm as being, being a weakness. What is your weakness? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think. Perhaps, um, my frankness, I think. My frankness in court, if I'm unhappy with the way you've handled the matter, I will make it quite clear to you. Um, and I think it's not a weakness. I don't see that as a weakness at all. Uh, I really don't see that as a weakness. Sometimes I'm saying people assume. In short, you don't have a weakness. Not, no, 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 we all have weaknesses. Sir. What we is all, your weakness? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you, 
you're making it quite difficult for me. I don't know. Maybe sometimes I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's very hard for me to say what my weakness is. Unless, you know, it's, it's, we, we all have weaknesses. We are all human beings. And judges are human beings as well. Uh, my weakness is that I'm short-tempered. Yes. What is your weakness? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not short-tempered, but sometimes, uh, well, sometimes I could be short-tempered, I suppose. But <laughs> I suppose I could be short-tempered. And I think we all, we all, we often talk amongst judges that, that, that uh, it's hard sometimes to keep calm. We try to keep calm. We keep very calm. We go into a matter. But sometimes litigants will drive you to a point. But that I didn't. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't being, uh, I didn't lose my temper in this matter. Uh, there was a lawyer. So who came my weakness to is your weakness. My, no, no, no. Your weakness is my weakness. Thank yes, you, Sichi. A lot of, a lot Thank of you, our Sichi. weaknesses. Thank are, you, Judge. Yes, 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 yes. The last question. Oh, are you are joining, Minister. Just, just a follow up. On, just a. Small. This is the last question, uh, Commissioner Masuki. You are withdrawing your. your okay. Thank no, no, you. It's, it's Thank just you. a follow up on this issue. I wouldn't have asked any question, but I just wanted to to put it to you, and I'd like to hear your reaction. You, uh, even the tenure of your voice, uh, just your manner of, of speech, um, at, 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 at best comes across to me as a little overbearing. Um, and for somebody uh, fairly junior to you, uh, you could be communicating perfectly naturally from your own point of view, but I can tell you sitting so far away from, from you, um, I, I myself find your voice a little bit uh, overbearing. Um, I, I'm glad that I'm far enough not to see any gestures or any uh, other, you know, body movements, but I can only assume from the tenure of the voice. Don't you think that there might be people who, who may feel you come across that way to them? even though that is not necessarily yes. your deliberate intention yes, sir, to I'm make very... people feel uncomfortable around you. Ye yes, Minister. I, I'm not sure that all people feel uncomfortable around me. Um, I, I am an assertive person, and I don't think I'm... I, I, I really don't think I'm overbearing. Uh, I, it's the first time that ever, I've ever heard anybody tell me I'm overbearing. I'm certainly not that. I... I, I I'm in a, in a, in a, I'm in a, in, a, in a room where I need to respond to questions. I'm going to respond to them in an assertive manner. Uh, I, it, it's very often that when a woman is assertive, she's seen to be overbearing, and, 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 and that's entirely incorrect. Uh, I, if, to the extent that I am assertive, I'm allowed to be assertive. I'm in a, in a, in a room where I need to basically uh, 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 give answers. Um, I need to, 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 to basically indicate why um, I should be appointed to that court. I, I, have, I really haven't been overbearing. You have, these are, this is one clerk out of hundreds of people that I've worked yeah. with through my years that, that has difficulty with me. Uh, By the way, just to clarify, it was just a subjective uh, yes, view. Yes, it's completely I'm not subjective. necessarily attributing it to anybody else. Yes, and I think it's quite unfair as well. Uh, okay. I am assertive, and I, I will not apologize for being assertive. Yes. I am no, very assertive, and I will not apologize for being assertive. Thank you. Assertive. I just wanted to test that. Yes. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Uh, as we part on a lighter note, uh, yes, Judge Katrice mm. uh, about people not telling you, <clears throat> um, the former Deputy Chief Justice went to the University of Pretoria to deliver a lecture and he met my, my little daughter who was studying there, who was mm. studying there. Mm. So when he came back, he says, we thank God for your wife. Considering your looks, we wonder what would have become of the little girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yes. You're excused. Thank you.